tell me a sound that's better than this. Nailed it. <laughs> There we go. Hey, Happy New Year. How's it going? Hi. This is Will Wisconsin. We will be taking all your questions today. I'm going to do a little bit of an AMA. Uh, I got a few things I want to give you my year in review. Time to reintroduce myself. Yes, you're correct. I am a needed trans male. Got it. Vasectomy turned me into a trans male. You're right. Rollo said he was really a trans male. Hey, live from the biggest little city in the world, Reno, Nevada, deep in the heart of the Nevada high desert. I am Rollo Tomasi in the Northern Command Center of Red One Studios. And now, this. The reason why men date younger women is not because of their physical appearance, their bodies. No, because today with plastic surgery and everything else, you barely know who is 40 and who is 18. <laughs> Guys date younger women because they're easily manipulated. They're going to be very happy with a few crumbs because maybe they didn't experience much in the world. They're going to be just easily impressed. And it's way cheaper to date a younger girl. Have you ever had a dream that that you um you had you 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 could you do you you want men that still kind of push this narrative that like women with very high body count is a sub woman why do you think they still do that they say they do it because of the research on body count which yeah. shows that people with higher body counts are more likely to be unfaithful they're less likely to be satisfied in monogamous relationships more likely to oh get divorced God. you know there's a lot of negative correlations with body count and they say that it's because of the research but then it's like the research shows the same effects in men and you're not yeah. saying that men with high body counts are problematic oftentimes these same guys are saying that men with high body counts are like successful or good. So right. it's like, eh, it's, it doesn't seem to be a research driven idea. My friend Alexander, who's a graduate student, he ran a survey and it wasn't a representative sample, mm -hmm. but he found that the men who cared the most about body counts were the least sexually successful. The underlying factor that we see is that men who care more about body count, at least in his survey, you tend to have more body counts themselves. It could be because they have religious beliefs about that. It could be higher disgust sensitivity. So they're obviously not going to have casual sex if they're really easily grossed out by that kind of thing. Or it could be sour grapes. This was Alexander's theory, which was that you can't reach the grapes. So they're too sour. The women who are having lots of sex don't want to have sex with you. And so you say you wouldn't want to anyway. So it could be that. And these are all hypotheses. None of these are tested. I think part of it is sexual insecurity. I think that that comes from the fact. So I guess we should take it all with a grain of salt, right, Mac? That there's just more points of comparison. Just statistically, if you're sleeping with a woman for the first time and she slept with nine other guys, let's say, and mm -hmm. you're number 10, it's just all else being equal, 10% chance that you're the best ever. Yeah. If it's 99 guys and you're number 100, it's a 1% chance. I mean, everyone's going to tell you that you're yeah. the best sexual experience. But most of the times, if they've slept with lots of people, that's going to be a lie. Okay. Some men know that and they won't admit it. But I think that that's why some men care about body count, well, if I had to guess. I'm a whore. Yeah. Body count. 20. 20. Let me go to my notes app. I'll just show it to the camera. <laughs> this is the list. So, you know, we got all that. that okay, so, period. like... I don't regret a single one. We all have fun. Okay, so like we on all the number, what, what, how, much, how much you think that this is? This gotta be at least 60. At least 60. Uh, she got 60. I have more than that. <gasps> yeah. Are we counting work or not work? Because I do this for work. Okay. Yeah, so if we're counting work, I don't know. Ugh. If we're not counting work, like okay. 98. Never mind. I am. Ugh. I want to catch up to her, so I am going to f another guy. <laughs> I am. I said I wasn't, but now I am. I got to catch up. Optimum amount of people to have on a roster at any one time? No more than five, because you might start calling them the wrong names. <laughs> call them all babe. Five is too much. It's like a small basketball team. With nobody off the bench, though, so nobody can get all hurt. Right, Got it. All right, all How'd right. you keep the feelings out of play? Never tell them your real name and don't tell them you love them. Okay. There you go. Noted. <laughs> Writing this down, I am. Like for me, I don't let men day text me if they're on a roster. 
I don't want any kind of like, hey, how's your day going? It's like, I don't want any mental energy. I don't mind that, but no holidays together. So don't ask me what I'm doing for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Nothing. Doing holiday alone. I'm doing nothing. Yeah. At home, two cats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like your vibe. Thank you, I try. Oh, no! Percent of single women are open and looking for single dads. I have enough right, uh, nieces and right, nephews right, that I could no. lie about. Why we like dads? <laughs> Great question. Glad you asked. It, they are we more stable, more mature, and they're less likely to play games. Oh, All right. women or just like single right. women are looking for single. Sixty percent of single childless women are. All women, oh, okay. single women, are looking for men with kids because they feel like they are more relatable, more responsible, more committed, more loving. So and like you married, guys married. are not. No, they are toxicas who love baby mama drama. Not all men with kids come with baby mama drama. All men with kids come with baby mama drama. <laughs> published in personality and individual differences found that women who are high in intrasexual competitiveness are more likely to advise women who they perceive as potential mating threats to cut off more hair in an attempt <laughs> to sabotage their attractiveness uh -huh. the researchers studied 450 women who were presented with hypothetical salon clients participants were asked to recommend the amount of hair to be cut off for each woman women who reported high levels of intrasexual competitiveness were more likely to recommend that clients have more hair cut off when the hair was in good condition and the clients expressed a preference for minimal cutting another finding is that women advise clients of similar attractiveness as themselves to cut off the most hair. Participants effectively targeted women they perceived as being on the same attractiveness level, potentially to try and reduce their attractiveness. Longer hair is a cue to youth and health. Yeah, men love long hair. I don't think women realize how much men love long hair. She's not a Christian! And now, for the separated at birth part of today's intro videos. Men in the RP world, these men will sit here and they'll shame women, they'll talk crap on women all day. Oh, women are hoes, women are this. But the problem is, is that you are the equivalent of a hoe because you're a bum. A bum for a man, a man that doesn't have his shit together, doesn't have a good career, that doesn't have his head on his shoulders, isn't a leader, isn't capable, isn't intellectual, etc. You are the equivalent of a woman who's a fucking hoe. It's the same shit. Woman with a high body count, woman that's fattest, woman that's unattractive, is the same thing as you in the sexual marketplace because you're supposed to bring safety, security. We know women look for survival violence and men look for replication value. If you're bringing to the sexual marketplace something other than what women are looking for, you're not gonna get selected. And then these people on their keyboards, spazzing out, <laughs> talking shit about women, you're in the desert talking shit about the water. You better take every drink you can fucking get, nigga. That's just how this shit works. How men tend to care about women significantly more than women care well, about yeah, men in terms of like the actual love, yeah. right? Women will love in this opportunistic fashion. They Wait, what? They love you with the Conditions. expectation and the condition that you- Wait, what? You're providing something in return, right? You're providing safety, security, etc. And they'll love you as long as you're yeah. doing that, right? Women perceive that as meaning that women love more. But what it is, you're loving him more because he met all your ton of conditions in the first place. And since all the men couldn't meet those conditions, but this one guy could, you're like, oh, head over heels for this guy. Yeah, got it. Yeah. But if he stopped meeting those conditions, you put a shot clock on him and eventually you're gone. This is why women leave relationships over 80% of the time to upgrade because you stop meeting their conditions, mm. right? Where did he pick that up? Is that the rules of the game are designed for a world in which there's baseline understandings of morality and the intersexual dynamic, but that has now been blown out the fucking water. If you're trying to play a new game by old rules, what? Wait, where, huh? That sounds awfully familiar. You're gonna get beat every single time. This is why, just to be fair here, I don't think that men should sit here and say, "Okay, I'm gonna play by the old rules yeah. of the game." Wait, what? Huh? If you want to be successful, you got to play by the new rules. Pen you got to spin plates. You got to be the black belt in sexual mar I'm sorry, what, what was that about spinning what? Mark plate. You got to have experience with women, etc. Maybe if you want to try to remix it and say, okay, well, I'm not going to engage in sex with these women, fine. But at least date them. At least go out. Have experience in the sexual marketplace dealing with female nature. Because if you enter a relationship, you don't have your shit together as a man. And you enter a relationship with a woman or even try to date a woman, she's going to milk you dry. She'll sit there, forego sex with you. And because you have a religious belief, you'll wait six months to a year for sex thinking, oh, this is normal. While she's f***ing the guy from McDonald's because he's hot. This is not yes. the modern sexual dynamic. As a man, mm. you must be the best option for them and you must operate by the new rules of the game what the new rules of the game i can't believe it holy mackerel welcome 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 where on earth would that guy by the way that guy's a podcast i think what's it called um 
uh, who hurt you podcast. <laughs> Bravo, dude. Bravo. <laughs> Spinning plates, conditional, opportunistic. Uh, let's see. What, what other terms can you rip off from my book, please? You know, when people like throw stuff at me and they're like, they want to talk about, uh, oh, well, Roller didn't invent all of this stuff. I'm not saying I ever invented it. I'm just saying I did come up with a lot of the terms that end up in shit like this. So welcome. Welcome. Happy New Year or soon to be Happy New Year. Thanks for uh Thanks for watching. Oh, Torsha, why are you getting me right now? <laughs> okay. I mean, see, this is what I get for leaving. Oh, there's Sam. Thank you, Sam. Sam bot is in the, uh, in the chat today uh, as my moderator. I think I got two more people in there as well. Um, how are you guys doing? I didn't think I was going to even do this show today, quite honestly, but I figured I'd give you a, a, a year review. Why not? We can do that. Um, I, uh, the reason why I didn't think that is because I was, I had to take Ned down to the vet again, um, because he had a new bandage, uh, applied about a day ago or two days ago, and he's getting what's called strike through, which means there's a little bit of a, like a seeping through of like whatever the fluids are. It, may, it might be blood, it might be pus. I don't know what the hell it is, but, uh, anyway, so, but they say if it, you ever see that, take, bring the dog in to have, have him rewrapped. So we went down there and, um, and so if I'm a little bit late, I apologize. <laughs> um, but uh, he's okay now. He's good. We're all we're all fine. Uh, happy he's sleeping downstairs right now. So we're all good. Uh, but uh, that didn't stop me. Uh, also, the, the other thing that almost stopped me was uh, the lighting in this room. I just got a new uh, soft box over here, and I'm kind of monkeying around with the uh, with the settings. So uh, if it looks a little bit different, maybe it does not. I can mess with the f stop here and see if I can do it. There we go. Much better. So I got that going. Um, I will be glad to answer all questions, any and all questions today. I don't know. Yeah, there's not going to be any limitation on on Super Chats today just because it's New Year's. So I figured we'd do that. Uh, did you guys check out uh, the Rule Zero end of the year show? I ended up hosting that as well. It was pretty good. Um, I thought it was good anyways. But uh, yeah, I've got that that guy. Uh, I don't I don't know who somebody just threw this in my my Instagram like reels and everything. And I. Uh, uh, I, I I picked it up and then I started looking at some more of these reels from this guy. And I guess the podcast is called, um, and I hate to give him like free traffic, but, but you know, okay. I mean, he's at least he's, he's aiming the right way. If you're going to lift my material, at least give me a reach around, bro. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I saw this guy. I don't know exactly what his, um, what his, uh, his shtick is. Um, am I echoing? No, I'm not. Okay. I'm good. All right. I don't know if I clicked it back over. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, again, I, I'm seeing stuff like this, you know, quite often. And so thought, you know, I'll call it out. I don't, I mean, at least you're on the right page, sort of. I think a lot of people are more averse to, uh, calling themselves red pill or they want to say, oh, it's red pill stuff, but you'll still use my material, but you'll go after red pill guys. And I'm going to talk about that for a little bit today too. Um, I think that's going to end up being one of my uh, prognostications for the coming year. Uh, I wasn't able to really go into depth too much on the Rule Zero uh, end of the year show. Um, so I might give you a little bit of, uh, of an embellished, uh, if you didn't get to see that yesterday, I'll give you an embellished uh, prognostication. I definitely have to, I'm, I'm going to definitely need this today. <laughs> So uh, we'll, we will look into the Magic 8 Ball, uh, regardless, of, irrespective of what Gary the Numbers guy might think. <laughs> gotcha. Um, but uh, let's see. Well, well, we can start with you, Rational Trucker. How do you feel? How do you feel being married for 40 years after meeting your wife at Woodstock, according to a blue? Pa yeah. Would you like me to pull that one up? I have that. Maybe I'll go dig that one out. Yeah. Woodstock. Yeah. No, it wasn't in Woodstock. Trust me. <laughs> Trust. Could you, can you like, can I like actually tell you what I'm really all about? That's funny. You should say that. Thanks Sink, for bringing that up. Yeah. We know who this was. That was kind of half the reason why I dropped in the, uh, the very first video with destiny. I thought that was interesting. Uh, yes. And I also get to also dig into, um, DJ academics. Uh, he wasn't really coming at me per se, but, um, I do know that he was just on, I think it was Marquette from, uh, I hope I'm saying your name, Marquette, Marquette um, from Saint and Sinner and Marquette got no love for DJ academics. So like we have, we definitely have that in common, <laughs> but uh, he was, uh, he was doing a breakdown video of, of uh, Axe um, latest where he was talking about how he got rolled for like 400,000 or $500,000. I can't remember uh, by his girlfriend. And I can't, 
like they don't pay me to keep up with that shit. So I, I don't really keep up with that. But uh, I did catch about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes of Marquette stuff because I, I do watch Marquette. Um, and uh, apparently he got rolled for uh, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars. If anybody has like like can correct me on that, I would please uh, you know chime chime in in the chat. I'll be happy to, to throw you on the screen. But um, yeah, I saw that and I thought it was interesting because I have some other people who are watching uh, Instagram, like my Instagram spies and my Twitter spies and everything. I don't call them spies. They just like throw things at me now and then. Um, and somebody said, or I forget who it was, but somebody was say uh, they sent me a link to a Reddit uh, post where um, DJ Academics was coming at the red pill. Um, those red pill guys. Uh, and I, I get it. That's he, he that's his shtick, right? He wants to. He wants to come at uh, he wants to come at the red pill. Some, it's, it's interesting to me because it seems like there's like a little bit of cognitive dissonance there for him because he's all very supportive of Fresh and, and Myron for the most part. But then comes at me and I'm like, dude, you know that Myron's like a majority of Myron's stuff. I'm not saying all of it, but a majority of Myron's stuff has been inspired or as a derivative of my books. Doesn't know, doesn't care. Same thing with uh, with the guys from uh, Flagrant 2, which I did see that. Uh, what was it? Uh, Andrew Schultz and Akash. I don't even know his last name. Uh, once again, throwing gasoline on the fire, Myron Gaines, <laughs> which, by the way, I think is kind of funny. But anyways, um, the, I mean, the time to have gone after Andrew Schultz was uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago when the when the iron was hot but i guess now like myron really wants to like fight somebody <laughs> myron it's like, it's like I, he, he wanted to fight who did he want to fight first i i, I forget who oh uh, abba abba from abba and preach he wanted to go after them first and then he wants to go now he wants to go I'm like, dude bro like slow your roll man <laughs> Uh, anyways, uh, let, I will, I will try to stay up on top of this stuff as best I can spectator those red pill guys. Thanks. Yeah. I, I need a shirt that says red pill, those red pill guys or that red pill guy. Maybe I should do that. I bet that would sell pretty well. Uh, what are the chances of legislation being introduced to punish bachelors that refuse to participate in society? Uh, slim to none, uh, because no one cares as long as you got a job, as long as you're gainfully employed, you're, you're as long as you're an efficient slave, that's it's all good. How do I feel after being for you? Yeah, I thought that was funny. I'm gonna dig that up, Rational Trucker. Actually, uh, Sam, if you can go dig that file up for me, I have it. I I just it's just on my YouTube history. I have to go. I'll just go find it. Uh, I wasn't planning on, on on digging into that, but maybe I will. Uh, Jason Crabber, uh, Happy New Year, Happy New Year to you too, my friend. Um, long time listener, first time caller, first time paying tuition for podcast pod class. Thank you very much. <laughs> the rational male should be required reading for all men entering the dating market. Thank you, Rolo, for uh, for everything you do. I don't think enough people really realize how old the rational male is. It is officially 10 years old as of soon to be last year. Uh, let's not forget uh, you are almost takedown in 23 due to a so-called troll. Mm, yeah, let's not forget that one. Almost. Uh, you've mentioned that insight for women is extremely rare. Yes. Uh, what percentage of women would you estimate have insight? That's a hard call. Uh, would you say most relationships fail because women lack insight? Yes, I do. Because uh, because insight. Okay, let me back up just a little bit. When I talk about like what is value added for a woman, like when people say, "Well, what's a high value woman, Rolo?" I'm going to point to the hottest piece of ass that I can find, right? I mean, what big tits, nice ass, uh, yeah, perfect, you know, thigh gap. I'm going to point to that first, obviously, because guys are going to look for, you know, fertility, youth, beauty, sexual availability. So let's just get those out of the way. And then we can get into other things, icing on the cake, right? And I think that if you are looking or you're vetting, I hate that word, you're vetting for a girlfriend, I'm not going to say wife, you're vetting for a long-term relationship, uh, I think insight is the number one thing men ought to be looking for in women, meaning that they are not just, I mean, for women to have like true insight, like real genuine insight, it means they have to in some way get over themselves. Um, they have to get past that innate solipsism. And I've done full videos about women's solipsism. I've done all kinds of um all kinds of essays on solipsism uh, on the solipsism of women and people like really want to call me to the carpet for that because they want to say well where's the where's the evidence where's the research on that? you're not going to find research on female solipsism because solipsism as a 
term is really a philosophical term, but it can also be a technical term, meaning that the only, you know, really the only thing that women think about is themselves. Not that that's a bad thing. That is a feature, not a bug of female nature. They have to be that way because they have to be concerned with their own survival. They are the incubators of the next generation and they have to be solipsistic enough so that the world kind of turns around them because they're interested, like almost like to the point of OCD about their own interests, about their own survival, about that they are the vulnerable sex. And so therefore looking for long-term security and security for their children. That is what I mean when I talk about solipsism in the sort of red pill, red pillian, red pillian terminology. Um, so am I talking about the philosophical concept? No, I'm talking about like the, the really the, the psychological concept and for a woman to have really to have true insight, to have some sort of like, you know, to question her own motives or have a question about why she did what she did. Maybe I should apologize. Maybe I should think differently about this. Maybe I should reconsider having those kinds of things. It requires a woman to sort of like push past that innate solipsism. And that's why it is so very rare. Uh, in women, because it's something that I think I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's probably a genetic component to it as well, um, like a like an intellectual an intellect, like an IQ component to it. But it's also, you know, what what was your upbringing like? Um, were you, uh, you know, how did you have brothers and sisters? That might be something that contributes to it. And I think that a lot of people mistake female solipsism for narcissism. And which is an easy thing to do today, because when you see women on like the women on the street talking about their their uh, body counts at Mac Murphy um, looking dead at you, we'll come back to that because I kind of want to get into the body count thing a little bit today, because that was one of the key uh, the key features, the key topics for uh, 2023. But um, pushing past that, um, getting past the uh, the sol the innate solipsism. And it, because you're going to uh, women in general are not going to be able to have sort of a true insight until they can sort of like, uh, I hate to say be busted down a notch because I don't even like that, but the, it's, it's learning humility, I guess. And a lot of women don't l really learn humility until it's too late until it's like, until they're in the, in the early thirties, maybe mid thirties range. And that's when they start thinking differently. And that's when it's like, Oh, I better get right with God. I better do things the right way. I need to start. I need to shape up. I need to do something. I've got a kid. Now I got to find a right. I mean, I need, I need a man with benefits. <laughs> um, and that's when insight comes in. I hate to say that like for most women, it is like something that they're sort of through trauma and crisis that they have to come to. Um, I, um, I think I also mentioned that most women are not, um, uh, they don't think in terms of grand strategy. And that's uh, also another rare gift is for women who can see sort of the force for the trees and say, okay, where do I, I'm, I'm 23 now, where do I want to be when I'm 33 rather than living in the moment and having everything be about, you know, the most immediate stimuli that's sort of coming to them. And you know, they're at the top of their game right then. Or you're just talking to the, you know, or you're just looking at the, uh, the on the street interviews of women and their body counts. Uh, you know, they're very forthcoming about that stuff. If you go, if you go and ask them casually on the street, I mean, they, they know that they're being observed. That one girl actually says, here's all the, here's all the dudes I'm banging, right? She's literally keeping a, a tally of all the guys and all the names, right? Um, why? I don't know. It's kind of interesting to me. Like if a guy, if a gamma male guy keeps a, an Excel spreadsheet of like all the reasons why his wife or his girlfriend or whatever, all, all the reason why he gets rejected or he gets turned down for sex because his wife has got a headache or whatever the fuck it is, right? That guy's a creep, but the woman who keeps like this big, you know, tally of this, this list of names of the guys that she's fucked. That's like empowering girl, you go. But if a guy did that, that's like almost, I would say that's sexual harassment. So interesting. You want to talk about double standards? I'll talk about double standards. That's a double standard right there. There are more, I will, I will go, I will die on this hill. There are more double standards for men than there are for women. Hit me up about that sometime. Uh, you mentioned the inside. Okay, I got the inside. Thanks, Tom. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ultra. Oh, do you want that one? Okay, I'll give it to you. I already used this already. She's not a Christian! There you go. Hope you're happy. I'll do that. You know what? It's New Year's Eve. You, you want a sound drop? I'll give you a sound drop. What it, what's F you money for all for you at this age? Mine is $12 million. Um, it's not two. I can tell you that right now. A uh, million dollars does not go as far as uh, as a lot of people think it does. I'm still not a quote unquote millionaire. So just uh, I'm going to put that out there on the record right now. 
Um, do I have a million dollars in the bank? No, I don't. Did I make a million dollars in any of the years that I've been sort of doing what I've been doing? No, I come close, but no. So uh, I will be, since we're getting to know Rolo Tomasi, I'll be more than happy to tell you this is like, I get, I get like, I rub elbows and hang out with guys like Robert Kiyosaki, Ken McElroy, Jason Hartman, uh, uh, George Gannon, guys who are, well, I would I'm, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that, uh, Ken McElroy, if he's not a billionaire, he's just this side of being a billionaire. I know how much these guys are worth. And y'all think I am way more paid than I am. <laughs> I'm really not. I, uh, I, I, was in a, I was in my Patreon group, my Zoom call, my Patreon group. And I was, I was talking about, I think this was last year. And um, I said, oh, sorry. You know, I was a little bit late. I said, sorry, I had to go out and shovel snow. I'm doing snow, my own snow removal at my, at my new place because I'm still, still kind of getting to know, you know, Red One Studios in this this area here. And they're looking at me like, you do your own snow removal? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm on my own goddamn lawn. I pick up the dog shit too. <laughs> it's just, uh, you gotta get done somehow. So I don't have people for that, but uh, uh, F you money, let's see. <sighs> Not 2 million because that goes so quick because I wanna do things with my money. Um, I would say probably, yeah, you said 12. Mm, that, even that's a little over the top. I would say probably like somewhere around eight, maybe eight to 10, I guess. Sort of do what you want. I can do what I want now. I buy the things that I want to buy. I bought two cars this year. I did. Cars that I wanted. I bought a Chrysler 300 Hemi. Nice. And I got a, uh, I have a new, uh, as you know, I've got the new Camaro as well too. That's my Vegas car. The the uh, the 300 was meant to be a Vegas car and it's probably still will be. I just have a garage for the, the winter time up here. But I get the things that I want. It's like, oh, it's not a Lambo. I don't care. The, the Camaro is going to have a, a, a twin turbo kit installed. So, <laughs> so it might not whip and it might not be a Lambo, but it's still going to make a lot of noise. Uh, let's see. Happy New Year. What would you say are the priority things to negotiate in a divorce for someone like D, like Destiny, the D? <laughs> we don't want to call him by his name, Steve, Steve Bunnell. Um, what are the priority things to negotiate? Well, I think he's already out of it. Uh, okay, I, I have a confession to make. I will I, I will cop to this because she'll probably just uh, uh, screen cap the, the, the messages anyways. But I reached out to, uh, to Melina because there was a point where I thought, hey, maybe, maybe James Sexton would like to represent Melina in her divorce hearings. And by the time I had already like made that approach or like I, I got into her DMs or whatever, uh, I said, hey, uh, I can put you in touch with James Sexton if you are going to be going through a nasty divorce or something like that. Unfortunately, she had already settled or there was already there was already a done deal. And so I'm like, I just left it alone. But um, like, well, if you need anything fine. But I think and, and this this is what uh, this is what James Sexton was telling me is that you can do a post nuptial agreement. And I thought, look, who the fuck is going to agree to that? <laughs> but apparently she she's already sort of cashed out or checked out. Um, I don't know. So don't ask me whether or not Destiny paid for her taxes. And I don't. Somebody said 200,000. Somebody said 300,000. I don't know. So you guys can go find out for yourself. But apparently there's been some talk about like, I don't know if this is in the past or maybe it was on his his uh, his Reddit channel or whatever the hell it was. Somebody was saying that he had. Uh, fronted her like $300,000 for like uh, back taxes or something like that. I'm not sure, but I do know that that was in some, it was a talking point, put it that way. Uh, not unlike, well, what I do know for a fact is that DJ academics got rolled for about what? 200,000, 300, I don't know, 400,000 or $500,000 by a girlfriend. If there's any guy and uh, I'm, you know, maybe I should just like put out a, a, a peace offering for, for DJ academics, because I know he's struggling with alcoholism right now. Um, but uh, I would say this is that if anybody needs the red pill, it's act act needs, he needs the red pill, especially, you know, he's, uh, I think somebody showed me this one video about like how he's talking about how well, the red pill doesn't talk about um, relationships or marriage or love or anything. I'm like, dude, <laughs> I'm like, do you, do you know who I am? <laughs> I, I, I think I, I, I didn't post anything about this, but I was uh, talking with somebody. And I said, you know, everything he says, the red pill doesn't cover. I covered in my third book, Positive Masculinity. I covered parenting. I covered marriage. I covered love. I've covered love. God damn it, man. I've covered love and damn near every single book I've ever written. 
But the red pill doesn't talk about that. No, dude, you just don't know any better. You're ignorant. And I don't mean stupid. I mean, just you just don't know. You just are ignorant of the facts. And I don't mean that in a, a mean way. I'm just saying, like, you just don't know what you're talking about. And uh, quite a few other people don't know what they're talking about either. Much like Macklemore does not know what he's talking about. But we would rather fight a straw man and we would rather uh, turn the red pill into a philosophy or a belief set or an ideology or whatever, because it's easier to fight it. Right. It's easier to. Well, if that's a belief set, then we can fight a belief with another belief. You can't fight that belief with facts. Right. Or you can't fight. You can't fight. the. You can't use belief to fight facts. It's like it's here. It is. This is why. Where are we wrong? Where am I wrong in my work on this equation and this math equation? That doesn't that doesn't get. That doesn't get debunked by your beliefs. They get, you could debunk it with more facts, or we can certainly discuss it and hash it out and say, okay, here's where, here's where you went wrong in this equation. Okay, great. I'm open to that. But don't like come at me or come at those red pill guys and say, like, this is what they say. Mm, no, that's not what we say. And if you think that before you start mouthing off, maybe it would like behoove you to go back through the archives. Like to go back through, like I've, I've got five fucking books. Okay. One of those books has been around for 10 years. If you ain't read it by now, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know about the, uh, the, uh, I would say as far as your, as far as your question is concerned here, as I would say, uh, maybe a post nuptial agreement. I don't know. Uh, I would say this though, and, and I've, this is actually part of uh, the book that I'm kind of say it's a loose book. It's a small book that I'm working on for the uh, for the um, 45 to 65 demographic that I'm doing uh, probably in first quarter, maybe second quarter of 2024 with uh, Joe Marin. Uh, we're doing a um, a group for guys who are between the ages of 45 to 65 years old. And uh, a lot of these guys are either post divorce or they're like in the machine right now. They're in the grinder right now. And um, I will definitely be um, referencing guys like James Sexton uh, for health and fitness. I'll probably be going to Thor Markinson, uh, May Drew Bay, some of these other guys that I know. Um, but uh, the um, as far as the divorce is concerned, uh, I know that uh, a lot of guys get they, they, they feel like they got blindsided. I don't know if that's Destiny's case because he's what, 34, 35. But um, I think that a lot of guys see it coming and they just don't want to admit that they see it coming or they, I think maybe in their peripheral awareness, they know the hammer's going to drop. They know that the sword's going to fall and they see the writing on the wall. They just like, they just don't want to believe it. So they rationalize things away. And then six months later, then the papers show up and you know, see ya. And I think on like a lot of people, like you probably heard me say this, or you probably heard or read this chapter in the first book, which is uh, the medium is the message. What is the behavior telling you? What is the message from that woman's behavior? Does she suddenly want to spend more time at the gym? It probably ain't for you. <laughs> just, oh, I don't know. I just thought to be more concerned with my health, honey. Um, so a lot of the times of when guys say that they got blindsided, the signs were there. They just didn't want to see those signs. I think it's important. That's definitely like recognizing that and understanding that, uh, understanding um, what you're probably in for. Uh, one of the things that I talked about with uh, uh, Jim Sexton was a lot of the, a lot of times men will think that they're going to have a quote unquote amicable uh, separation or amicable divorce until attorneys get involved. And as James Sexton is happy to say all the time, I am a weapon, use me. And that's usually where it, where and what happens. So suddenly that amicable divorce, you know, you, you believe this, you go to the table and suddenly she wants the dog and she wants your cars and she wants half the house and she wants half the business. Um, yeah, because she might be that way, but the divorce attorney is also looking up for her own, her, his own interests as well. So and then, of course, it might behoove them to uh, build a narrative about you as a quote unquote abuser or you didn't want to go to counseling or you didn't want to. We tried to save the marriage and you didn't even know you're trying to you didn't even know there was an issue to save the marriage in the first place. Right. One of the things I think is probably the biggest racket in the divorce industrial complex is uh, marriage counseling, because nine times out of ten, a couple goes to marriage counseling. Uh, I'm going to quote. Uh, uh, Tom Likas here. Where's Tommy? There he is. Dump that bitch. Marriage counseling is last stop before toll. <laughs> Thanks for that, Tom. 
because it's uh, it's usually uh, meant to establish it's, it's a character reference at that point. Understand when you're in that because you're not going to it's not like they're going to tell you that if you don't show up that, well, we, I made that she made an effort. How come he couldn't? There's a, there's a process that goes along with that. Those are the things I think you need to watch out for. Uh, do you believe the DHS will take additional actions against the manosphere, the mesosphere, the manosphere uh, space this year? The DHS, no. The NGOs that receive money through the DHS, through the American tax dollar, probably. And I uh, I, I talked about this on Rule Zero yes, uh, yes, just yesterday. Uh, in case you haven't got the memo, uh, I've been myself, uh, I think, uh, whatever podcast, uh, Myron and Fresh, of course, Tate, Pearl, uh, wait, Pearl. Have you ever had a dream that? Okay. <laughs> That's Pearl's sound drop. Uh, we're implicated or we're I'm saying a write up. I'm, I'm going to do I've been I've been biding my time on like doing a big ass mega show on the NGO DHS links because it's still it's a lot of this stuff is still building right now. A lot of the stuff that I didn't know about, I'm glad I haven't really gone whole hog just yet because when I was about to do that, there was something that sort of held me off from doing it. So because I needed to get more information about other details because it's a lot, it's very complex, but the, um, the long and the short of it is, is that the department of Homeland security uh, funds, certain studies like the incel study, but not themselves, not through the DHS, but through NGOs, non-global, non-governmental organizations. And those non-governmental organizations can be pretty much anything, but they were started like back in the uh, the mid 2000s or the early 2000s through uh, President Bush because they wanted watchdog organizations to watch out for like uh, domestic terrorism and foreign terrorism. And uh, maybe in the beginning it had a, maybe there was actually some, you know, some merit to starting these things, but now they become a racket. And so during the Obama years, uh, they, they canceled the NGOs and then they brought them back under a different name. It's just basically the same thing. They just had a different charter. Trump was going to, you know, cancel them and he brought it back in another charter. Say they just renamed these things. Biden did the same thing, rename these NGOs or whatever the charter, the mission statement or what they're supposed to be doing. But they're just basically the same NGOs. And we've gotten to the point right now where, uh, as you have probably heard me say a dozen different times, is if there is no boogeyman, no one gets paid. And it used to be that we could say, okay, well, there's, um, you know, Islamic terrorism or there's homegrown, there's sleeper cells, right? And then it became like uh, white supremacism and then it became um, domestic terrorism and then it became all these other things. And there needed to be a really easily sort of hateable, uh, convenient boogeyman. And now uh, apparently it's the red pills turn. And I don't think it's any coincidence that all of this gets a little bit more exaggerated and a little bit more ramped up in uh, the buildup or the the election cycle. And by the way, we started the 2024 election cycle right around August of this year, maybe July, um, because remember, in the United States, our elections take place on the first Tuesday of November. So we're already less than a year away from the from from Election Day. And uh, I think that is going to color pretty much every conversation that we have online, podcasts in general, whether you're political, whether you're social, whether you're into intersexual dynamics, whether whatever it is, religious, racial, whatever your whatever your grift is, it's going to be colored by the next probably eight months, nine months of electioneering. And part of that electioneering is non-governmental organizations trying to find another boogeyman. Well, why would that? Why are they going after incels? Because they're easy to hate. As I said before, incel is just a is just vernacular for lo- loser. You're a perma virgin. You're a dork. You're a dweeb. You're the guys we used to give atomic wedgies to in the locker room in high school, right? You're you're down on your luck. You're never gonna get laid. You're you're uh, you know man up, stand up straight, chest out, make your bed. <laughs> the uh, the Lost Boys generation. By the way, we're moving into the third iteration of the Lost Boys generation. But uh, but now we can call them incels. It's just a convenient, cutesy online. It, it sounds better than saying you're a loser. It sounds better than saying you're a perma virgin. It pa- sounds better than you're never going to get laid. You're a, you're you're a uh, a eunuch. You're you're doomed. 
for like, it sounds better than that. And it sounds like people have some sort of concern. We're going to do some studies. We're going to make sure, see where these guys are at. Maybe it's the red pill that's radicalizing these incels, right? Well, let, if you can't find the data you're looking for, you'll manufacture it. And that's exactly what they've been doing really for the better part of last year. So that we have something science-y and something data-ish that backs up the, the fact that these are, we have to watch out for them. We need to, we're, these NGOs, we're doing something, right? We, we, here's a report. Here's a study that we did all on Twitter. Here's a study that we did uh, on online surveys that we had to pay these guys from one incel forum to participate in. But here we did, we did our, look, look, NGO, look, DHS, look, government. We did some work here. It's like, oh, look busy. The busy is we did all this stuff. Give us, give, gives me that, gives me some more money. And that's what it comes down to. And by the way, I can, I can name three of them right now. One's, gonna, one's called Moonshot. There's another one called, um, uh, was it a divert hate? Divert hate is the one that would like to divert my traffic over to guys like uh, Justin Baldini at the, or at the uh, Man Enough site or his blog or wherever he's doing, right? It's, it's, the, it's this effort to convince Elon Musk and the higher ups, I guess, at, at, uh, at Google, YouTube to redirect my, my links and redirect my traffic and put disclaimers on my posts so that if you want to get to a healthy masculine alternative, go see man bun guy, Jason Baldini, because he's the one who's going to teach you about love and flowers and, and how to kiss your wife's ass and, and, and how, to be a, how to be a real man by crying on demand. Right? Or, uh, ma or the, the, uh, the Good Man Project. If you don't know who the Good Man Project is, go to YouTube right now and type in, in the, search, uh, the search query there. Uh, type in um, Dear Woman. Good man project, dear woman, and watch that video. It tells you everything you will ever need to know about the good man project. Sorry, right? it's all summed up in a nice like like ten minute video. I mean, that's seven minute video. That's and it's from ages ago, but they're still around, which ought to tell you something. But they're going to divert my traffic and Ryan's traffic, and not just me, by the way, uh, Brian from uh, whatever podcast. Um, everyone else who is the the usual suspects. It's a great movie. The usual suspects, we're going to divert their traffic over to healthy masculinity. And I think it says more about that NGO as to who they consider healthy masculinity as opposed to a red pill podcast pod class that relies on factual absolutism that relies on that has a, has an obligation to objective truth. Remember what I said. The, the language of empiricism will always sound like hate and anger to the language of emotionalism. And if you go and you look at Jason, Justin Baldini's side, it's all emotion and we, we need to take care of our boys. And fa, 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 fa. That's, that's what it boils down to. Don't go to the gym. Sit here and cry with me. Have a cup of coffee. Here, have a cup of coffee with me. Mm. Chai tea. <laughs> yeah uh i think it will it will ramp up those are uh oh, and the other one was uh imran ahmed's uh what was it uh the center for countering digital hate like guys can you like come up with a better acronym the center for countering digital hate at least they, at least they're a little bit they have a broader brush stroke on on their on their site but yeah I didn't even know who, I didn't even know what an NGO, I didn't know that there were watchdog NGOs for the Manosphere right up until I did the Dr. Phil show. And then I was like, oh, this is interesting. Who's coming at me? Uh, e. Jones, thank you, my friend, for becoming a member. And let's see, what we should have, I need a, a, a sound here. Thank you very much. Can I be in charge for a while? It's about time, man. I thought you were a member already. <laughs> Uh, does the solipsism of modern women guarantee the dissolution of modern society given the proliferation of passport bros? No, they did. The pa passport bros are not, go are not going to save you. <laughs> I think a lot of people really, really want some comeuppance. They want to feel like they're in charge. They want to take, take the power back somehow. Does solipsism of modern women guarantee the dissolution of modern society given the proliferation? Of no. And I think, again, first of all, how many guys are actually passport bros? 
we have what what is what's is the population in the united states now 330 million maybe it's it might be more than that i think the last i looked it was 330 million of that 330 million i mean we know half of them are women right so but of the the male population in the united states how many of those guys what's the, what do you think the the percentage of the population is that would cal, call themselves passport bros i would love to know like even a ballpark estimate of that i asked that by the way um i tried to find out what the uh, what the percentage of guys who self-identify as incels was at, right after was it was it will will costello's uh uh research paper and then by the way there's an alex uh, thomas his his cohort his friend decided to chime in as well in fact maybe i should just show you guys out here hold on a sec i think i have these loaded already where to go uh this was oh that's brett cooper sorry that's for another topic this is andrew thomas right are you an INSA? Are you an INSA? We got to read this like a cheesy, like tele, like a, a, t- a television, like a, 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 what is it? A local access television ad. Here we go. Are you an incel from the, from the U S <laughs> where are there any anywhere else? <laughs> we're, uh, we're currently recruiting for a recruiting. You notice the language here. We're currently recruiting for a new study on incel perceptions of men and women's mating psychology because they're, we don't want to let the leave the little ladies out of the equation. It takes about 30 minutes and pays all of $7.50 through a third party. Yeah, that third party, an NGO, <laughs> and is funded by my university. No, it's funded by the NGO. The study is. But the 750 that you got to pay these guys, that's through the NGO. That's why he's trying to make that distinction right there. You'll ha- also have the option to donate payment to charity because we know what great humanitarians you incels are. <laughs> um, you can find out more about it here. There's a link. And you can also read more about it, us and our commitment to unbiased research on incels there. Uh, yeah, it didn't work very well the first time. If you have any questions or concerns, please get in touch. Well, when you do, And you ask certain questions, you get blocked. (laughs) And so that was a variation of uh, another study that was done. I don't know if I have those. Where do I have that? uh, That's the most recent one. But the first one, which which took place, by the way, in May of uh, of this year, uh, beginning of May, was the first study that they did. And this is what really brought this to my attention because not so erudite came all, got all up in my grill for saying, you know, hey, don't participate with these guys. It was just bad research methodology. And so, so I was I was looking at this and like they're paying these guys to take online surveys to basically rat themselves out. It's like, what's to what's to keep them from like just making, you know, bullshit accounts and just making money off of this? Now 750 ain't that much, which is kind of st- silly because they offered $25 on the first one. <laughs> I was like, man, is this inflation. <laughs> so uh, let me see if I can find. Do I have those somewhere? No, oh, those aren't the ones I'm looking for. Uh, uh, these aren't the quotes you're looking for. No, those are my destiny quotes. You don't want to see those. Uh, let's see, I'll move. Hold on, to take that out of there. Oh, is it in is it my data? No. Well, anyways, the um. I swore I could have swore I had the Marnie loaded. That's all right. No worries. I'll come back to that. Anyways, that was the the most recent one. There was another one by Will Costello, who, by the way, he got his doctor. I don't know if he's a doctor, Dr. Will Costello right now, but that was the incel research study was the basis of his doctoral thesis funded also by an NGO. <laughs> I don't know if it was divert hate. It might've been moonshot. I'm not really sure, but, um, Again, watch out for these guys, because if they can't find data to have a boogeyman, they'll manufacture data and then they'll get people like, oh, I don't know, uh, this hack right here to uh, recruit for Tom, Dr. Thomas. Look, by the way, here we go. Well, this was uh, Alex. This was Alex from Date Psych recruiting for Will Costello, who also, by the way, is I, I want to say a colleague of Dr. Thomas. I, what's his name? This guy for uh, this guy, Andrew G. Thomas. And this is the shilling. The shilling begins uh, again. CT CT project got it. Okay, we are launching again. Swansea University, same one as this guy, right? Same right here. 
Uh, and if you're a part of the Incel community, uh, we would like to talk to you. If you're an Incel in the UK or the US, at least they're, now they're specifying, please take a moment to participate in their research, right? Okay. All of these guys are in bed together. I should add one more name to that list, and that's Chris Williamson also. Also recruiting for both of these guys. So what is their interest in this? I don't know. Is it affiliate marketing? Are they making like a percentage? Are they making like 10% or whatever off the money? Hey, you get more guys in here. You're going to get $10 per head. I don't know how it is. They have very, very low turnout for these things anyways. But don't let that stop them from convincing you that everything that comes out of this data set is settled science about incels. So I was asking, long story short, I was just asking about like, well, what's the overall um, percentage of men who identify as incels? You know, what's the overall percentage of guys in the United States who, who call themselves passport bros? I would say it's minuscule. <laughs> Uh, 2024, Troy will change his mind about marriage and will make a baby with Tiffany Fox. Wait a minute. Hallelujah. Only Pat Stedman's Polish passport would say something like that. You know that, right? Wait, hold on. Hello. <laughs> um, I will take that bet against. I will take the under on that. I don't think that that will happen. I'm, I'm fairly confident in saying that. Keep the Camaro naturally aspirated. What? <laughs> Twin Turbos are more trouble than they're worth. Mm, it depends on who you have to do it. <laughs> Unless it's a full race car. And <laughs> sometimes these upgrades are not worth the trouble. I, I will tell you this. It probably will not get quite as good gas mileage after, after my brother puts a Twin Turbo in it. Uh, in case you don't know that, that's something I don't think anybody really realizes. I have a, a younger brother. People don't. People don't. <laughs> uh, let's see. His name is... Roberto, Roberto Tomasi. <laughs> Sounds like, this is like an F1 rider racer. <laughs> and Roberto Tomasi um, uh, reconditions and uh, creates and builds uh, classic muscle cars. He's my, my brother's been a gearhead forever. I like to drive the cars. He likes to build the cars. Um, and he has his own garage. Uh, he uh, builds uh, custom builds and he goes to Barrett Jackson. Uh, if you're familiar with Barrett Jackson, they're the auction house that you'll occasionally see probably like once or twice a year on ESPN. And you see these really great muscle cars. Some of them are stock. Some of them are like, you know, overclocked. Some of them are, you know, race cars, bracket racers and stuff like that. My, my brother and I, when we were younger, uh, bracket racing was a, was a thing. Um, but he builds, uh, probably does about two or three cars a year. And then he auctions. That's how, that's how he makes money, right? Uh, he auctions them at uh, Barrett Jackson. And uh, he does, he can do custom work like twin turbo kits. Uh, let's see. I uh, love how people give me shit for not getting married, even after telling them about my dad and my grandparents and my grandparents getting divorces. Yep. Oh, speaking of marriage. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait. Oh. Hold, hold the damn phone here. Since you brought that up, why don't we just put this one on right now? This is what it looks like to be unshakable, ladies and gentlemen. Let me explain that. Young men, we're just gonna cut right to it. If you want to be an immovable mountain in your life, if you wish to be a strong alpha, I beg you. <laughs> Fall in love, get married, have more children than you can afford, <laughs> have insane amounts of kids. There's nothing the world can do to shake you if you do those simple steps. And if you acknowledge that God. I'm pretty sure the world can shake you. <laughs> Perhaps we should get James Sexton in here to give us some, uh, you know, don't take my word for it. We need an expert witness to let us know if the world can shake you. <laughs> Loves you and has a purpose for your life. That's it. That's it. And you are immovable, unshakable. Yeah, there you go. Turning point U U USA with Benny Johnson. I have no idea who this dude was, but TP USA is. <sighs> okay, first prognostication. Here we go. Wait, here. Wait, 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 wait. There. He chose poorly. First prognostication of the New Year's Eve show. Will Magic 8 Ball, will 2024 be the year of the Tradcon? 
Signs point to yes. <laughs> it actually did say that too. Yes, it's going to be the year of the trad con. Uh, we're already seeing this. Uh, if you have, if you're, ha if you have not been privy to the calendar debate, the uh, the hot conservative women's calendar debate, and how trad trad femme women lost their shit over a calendar of good looking chicks that have oh I don't know American flag bikinis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently that's a, a thing and I, that's why I threw oh by the way that's why I threw the uh, the beer commercial in the at the very beginning of today's uh, intro videos because apparently that's where we're headed and if you want to know and just to explain here if you want to know why the red pill is going to be or me probably me personally maybe they will actually you know uh, maybe they'll actually say my name they'll actually say my name at some point I doubt it. I should just say I'm, I need one red pill, that red pill guy, uh, because I think that one of the reasons why you're seeing this ramp up of incels and ramp up of um, of NGO watchdogs, you know, who want to tell you all. Here's what the manosphere is really about. As, as if we don't have enough, you know, sort of evangelical uh, uh, Christo red pillars uh, sort of muddying the waters recently as if we don't have enough of that now we got trad femmes coming in and uh baking oh i don't know breakfast sandwiches and bread and apple pie with big tits and a crucifix nexus by the way here i am going to start offering crucifix nexus necklaces on the access vegas merchandise site because apparently if even if you just have a nice tight sweater and some big ass titties all you need is a crucifix necklace. And then now you're, you're approved. It's like the Jesus fish stamp of approval. Like it's Christian kosher. Well, she got big tits. Well, oh my God, dude. No, she's a former only fans girl. She's not like that anymore. She married a youth pastor. <laughs> See that crucifix necklace. A okay. She's okay to hit up, find a woman, get married, have more kids than you can afford. <laughs> Make sure she bakes bread and apple pie. Boy, that sounds really good, doesn't it? God, that sounds awesome. Awesome. Real good. I'll tell you, you know, the, the funniest thing is, and since we're getting to know Rolo Tomasi today, I've been married for 27, almost 27 and a half years right now. I got married in July 20th, 1996. Steve, Bunnell, Destiny. Married in 1996. I've been in like people say, well, how come he's what's he talking about? How come he's, he's not been in the dating market for a long time? Blah, blah, blah. You don't have any clue what I've done for my my job and my career from then to now, which was, we can talk about later. But married since 1996, 27 and a half ish years. My daughter's 25. I did not knock up my wife and get baby trapped. Thank you very much. 27 25 there's about two years left two, two and a half years wiggle room right there nobody wants to, like i i gotta correct a few of this these misnomers or these like this these this bad information this gossip really is gossip um about like what i'm about and who i'm who i'm married to and what my family life is and what like life is behind this screen over here i'm happy i've been forthright and forthcoming about that for a very long time. Hell, I was writing posts about it on So Suave as far back as 2006. <laughs> Earlier than my blog. So, I, you want you want to ask questions about my wife, my kid, my dogs? I'll be, let's have a Greyhound show for Christ's sake. Can we do that? But no. I am 55 years old, not 95 years old. I did not get married after Woodstock. He's a boomer. Ha, 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 ha. Dude, all I've done is like extend olive branches and try to help, but eh, I only spit in my face for so long, my friends. <laughs> the red pill doesn't talk about marriage and relationships and love and all that stuff. They just want to tell about, tell you how to get your dick wet. Dude, motherfucker, I've been married for 27 years. You don't know that because you don't care to know that. So 27 years. Um, and so I think what a lot of people think is, well, Roll is not living the lifestyle. Well, what lifestyle am I supposed to be living? I've been forthcoming about everything since day fucking one. Don't believe me? Go back to my earliest posts on the rational mail from 2013. 
Go back to my earlier posts. You can even go do uh, searches for my, and then you don't even have to go to Wayback Machine. Just go to SoSwap.net. Go to the forum. Type in Roel Tomasi. Early, I could go and look for the earliest posts, like filter for the earliest posts. And then just work your way up. <laughs> There's only one person I know who's done that. That's Torsha for fuck's sake. Not you guys, but Torsha will do that. But um, yeah, I've been forthcoming about everything since day one. You want to know why like Destiny and these sons of bitches and Lauren Southern and, and cow-eyed Brittany Venti have to make up shit, have to manufacture shit? Because they can't find anything. They're like, oh, we got to find some dirt on this guy. We found some on Donovan, Donovan Sharp. We found some on uh, Modern Life John. Well, let's go. Let's, let's see if we can get the godfather of the manosphere. Can't get me. I've been up front since day fucking one. Oh, well, then we'll have to make something up. Yeah, with this very elaborate hoax. We're going to have to make something up to, to sort of you know get. We're going to make dirt. <laughs> that's That's the level of OCD. That's the level of desperation. Uh... Tips for guys listening to Manosphere books on Audible. Don't link your Amazon account with your wife through Prime. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, wife said I had some interesting books uh, when she subbed to Audible. Yeah, she'll by the they'll see. Don't have a family account. And also another thing is, is if you uh, if you have like a, if you have an Apple account or a Mac account and you have like you have the family plan or whatever, be like if you're buying apps or you're getting whatever. It's pretty much fair game. Everybody can, everybody on that list can see it unless you like make it private. Yeah, that's a, by the way, this is just you being lazy. <laughs> Why is the red pill anti-marriage, but married minus Troy, but married minus Troy. A better question is why don't people like call that shit? out? I'll t but here's why, because in the same week that I got, Steve Bunnell saying, oh, Rolla must, he's been married forever. What, how could he say anything? Blah, 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 blah. He got married at Woodstock. In the same week, I'm also seeing DJ Academic saying, well, the Red Pill doesn't talk about love or relationship or marriage. None of these guys, half of the time I see women on Twitter, trad femme women. And by the way, that's going to be, that'll be the uh, trad femme will probably be the uh, jingoism for 2024. Trad femme females. The uh, the uh, married to Christ females, the Christo red pill or the uh, the remnants of whatever it is, they're, they're going to be the ones to say, well, you know, th these guys, OK, they just care about body count or Myron hurt my feelings. They don't care. They don't care about marriage. None of these none of these guys have successful marriages. Why would you want to be like that? Like, Do you know that? Do you fucking know that? No, you don't. How many, how many, first of all, who are those red pill guys with that? We got to clear that air first, right? And of the guys that you got, the names that you actually possibly could name, Say how many, name. how many of them do you think are married? Oh, well, then they shouldn't be talking about what they're, well, okay. So I roll up Tomasi can't be red pill because he's married and he can't be married because he's red pill. Make up your fucking minds. Like, let's go one direction, please. Because that's what it boils down to. And I'm sick to fucking death of it right now. Uh, so the red pill is not anti-marriage. Not anti-marriage. Now, as far as I know, black pill doomers, maybe uh, insoles, maybe MGTOW. I've been married for 27 and a half ish years. I can't be anti-marriage. I can tell you all the stats of why it's a bad idea to get married. I have said this again and again and again and again, and apparently I need to say it one more. I got to have this as a, just a fucking sound drop, right? I'm not against marriage. I'm against the way we do it now. I'm not against college or university or having a, you know institutions of higher education. I'm not against that. I'm against the way we do it now. It's a great concept. It's a great, I think it's a higher education. You, you owe it to yourself to be a well-educated human being. A man should be able to speak knowledgeably on a great many different topics, even if he's not an expert on every single one of those things. You have to be able to have a capacity for critical thinking, and perhaps that's best developed in a school-like setting of some sort. Or you have a mentor, you have an atelier, if you're an artist, right? Don't, there's your, so that's your vocabulary. That's your French vocabulary word, an atelier. What, like, how do you... I feel so, oh, well, you know, uh, guys are dropping out at, at record rates and they are. I just, I don't see if I can find the stat for it. Somebody sent me this not too long ago. It's in my bookmarks here. Hang on. 
where did it go? Ah, U.S. college student enrollment declines from 2017 to 2021. Approximately one and a half million students. Percentage of this decline attributed to male students, 71%. And that is from the Wall Street Journal right here. I wonder if I could put that up. About 1.5 million fewer students are enrolling in college, are enrolled, uh, are, are enrolled than before the pandemic, says a report from the National Student Clearing House. Whatever that is. College enrollment dropped for the third consecutive school year after the start of the pandemic, dashing universities' hopes that a post-COVID rebound was at hand. The rate of decline has slowed this fall, with student with college enrollment dropping to 1.1% since last autumn. Over the first two years of the C-19 pandemic, Enrollment fell about six and a half percent, according to the National Student Clearinghouse of a nonprofit that released a report on Thursday. Wow. Apparently, 71 percent of that drop is accounted for by men not entering into college. So, well, Rolla, why would you want to go into this socialist feminist indoctrination camp? Because it didn't used to be that way. You want to see the be the change that you want to see in the world. Right? Where are you going to learn that? I asked this from one time. Uh, that's funny. I just now recollect this. I remember like talking to Robert Kiyosaki one time and, and I, I love Robert like a brother. I talk to him all the time. Um, but one at one point he was talking about like how universities were like just these, you know, communist indoctrination camps and they're socialist and they're communitarian. Because like, what is it? 78% of your teachers are going to be like female anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm sure that socialism sounds really good to uh, college teachers because first of all we pay them like shit and then sec or well high school everything we pay them like shit and if and they're all female so yeah I'm sure socialism sounds pretty damn good to to women because they already have a, a predisposition for communitarianism and egalitarianism so what are they going to teach you what are the, what's going to be the side lesson we all can we all just get along the workers control the means of production. Yeah, of course you're going to get, you know, socialism in, in your in your universities when when let's see, 78 percent of your teach 78, 79, it's probably gone up. I'm I'm thinking 75 or 77 percent. And that was stats from like 2016. Richard Reeves was saying it was even worse than that, like the the uh, the percentage of women who are in education from the time you're in preschool till the time you're in like postgraduate school, mostly in public schools, of course. But uh it's a female profession now and not because it's like a gender rolled profession. It's because only women are teaching your kids right now and have been doing that for really the past four generations. So what do you, what do you get when education is by women for women taught by women to little girls who want to be astronauts and little boys who should just, you know, stand down and, not go to college or not like what's what's the incentive i don't think that guys are necessarily lazy or listless i think they can be motivated to do stuff hell if you look at my haters they're very motivated like well, well these guys are, don't do anything they just play video games and stroke off to 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 porn and and you know smoke weed and order uber eats in their mom's basement like that's the that's the online popular opinion i'm like i'm not of that opinion because if you look at the OCD and the level of incentive they have to like hate on me and try to dox me and try to screw with me or try to fuck with other people as well, they are very motivated. <laughs> they are very committed to that purpose. <laughs> it's all about incentives and they just simply don't have incentives anymore. But again, red pill is not necessarily anti-marriage. I'm not anti-marriage. I'm not anti-education. I just don't think the way we do it now it makes it, there's no incentive. What's the, like, I'm, I'm open to people telling me why I should find a woman, get married, um, you know, have more kids than I can afford and be unshakable. You've been be unshakable. Yeah. Until you, <laughs> until what is it? Uh, what was the title? The title of James Sexton's book is uh, if you're in my office, it's already too late. <laughs> That's shakable for you. <laughs> Oh, man. Thank you very much for this. Uh, I think that's a sticker. Sorry. Displaying ways. Uh, if you had a, a message attached to that, uh, make sure Sammy gets it to me. Thanks. 
Uh, what do we got here? Hey, Rolo, in terms of NGOs, I'd look into how the CSIS carried out the transcripts against a meme made by Jeremy McKenzie when the apex hit when the apex hit for convoy. OK. Jeremy McKenzie, I'll look that up. I promise I will. I don't know anything about it, but I'll educate myself. Rolo, which strategy do you consider superior for the future of the red pill? OK. To remain rebellious as a subculture or to try and shift itself into a more legitimate alternative acceptable uh, alternative acceptable by mass culture. It will never be accepted by mass culture. End of story. Because mass culture is defined by gynocentrism. It will never be acceptable by, by mass culture. If it was, you'd already see everybody embracing this stuff. I think a lot of people will resist the red pill based on ideological, ethical, whatever terms. That's, a, that's, that's too easy for them not to do that right now. So if you have like the guy from Turning Point USA and like a lot of the things that you're seeing happen right now is what I call tilling the field. And I brought this up on, on, uh, on Rule Zero yesterday. What is tilling the field? It's sort of preparing the crops to sow the seeds so that you get the crops later on. In this case, they'll be in, I don't know, first week of November. So why would we want uh, incels as boogeymen? Well, because they're easy targets. It's low-hanging fruit. They're easy to hate. They're losers. They're permavirgins. They're the kind of guys that you don't want your sister to date or to get obsessed with your daughter. You don't want those guys. You don't want an incel to be like obsessive compulsive about your daughter because he might hang himself or he might hang her. God knows what could happen because of that, right? And they're easy to hate. And they're easy to sort of amplify and multiply. It's almost like the red scare. It's like the uh, there's a there's a communist under every rock, right? There's an incel under every rock. Where is it? <gasps> there's an incel. And as soon as like, say, a pro feminist movie or the next Star Wars or the next whatever name, the franchise, right? Name the, the pop culture, gaming, sci fi, fantasy franchise. Somebody throws the movie out there and it flops. And you know what? Their first thing they say is that's those fucking incels. They, they're the ones that screwed it up. They, they're the ones that like uh, brigaded uh, Rotten Tomatoes and gave us all bad reviews. Yeah, that's the that's the go to. In fact, I would I would go so far as to say that the if a if a movie company, if a movie warehouse, whatever, if a movie company knows that their product or their movie is going to fall flat and be a piece of shit. The PR company moves into that mode, like, well, let's blame it on the red pill. Let's blame it on incels. Let's blame it on toxic masculinity. Let's blame it on whatever. We know it's going to be a dog, so let's be ready for that. And real, so what do we do? We blanket, oh, I don't know, I, IMDB or whatever the whatever favorite, you know, entertainment gossip, you know, movie blog aggregate is. Just be ready for it. The, the, the article's already written. Before the movie launches, the article's already written. What was it? Rings of Power? Before Rings of Power even came out, I guarantee you they already had uh, contingencies for when people go, it, it's, it's wokesy. It's all very wokesy. It's, it's, it's this want for nostalgia, but you decided that you were going to put this wokesy narrative into it. And we know that, and they know that. And so we've got to find some way to sort of counter that. And what's the most logical rationale for that? It's the incels. It's the red. It's Rolo Tomasi teaching these guys toxic masculinity. That's why the series failed. <laughs> they need that guy. They need you need me. You need a, 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 a frothing at the mouth madman who's radicalizing these incels so, because your movie sucked and he's the one who got all of them to to you know downvoted on Rotten Tomatoes. How easy is that? Now that's just tilling the fields for movies. Now now. Take that and put it into a political theater. Well, if Trump can't get on the ballot, it must be the incels. We didn't do enough. You guys didn't get off your ass. You're too busy stroking off and playing, I don't know, soon to be a Grand Theft Auto 6. <laughs> Mike Sartain. You guys are too, too busy playing Skyrim or whatever the fuck you're playing right now. Or, or uh, Madden. <laughs> whatever is popular. Smoking weed. You guys are smoking too much weed eating gummies eating edibles it's on you it couldn't be the women oh wait no sorry it could be the women you're marrying these guys who are not motivated or you're not marrying them 
So that's why Hillary got into office. That's why Gavin Newsom gets into office. That's why B- Biden gets into office, because you you guys didn't man up enough and marry these marry these hoes. It's your fault because they women will tend to vote for who their husband votes for. Get the fuck out of here. So it's your fault, trad guy, for not manning up and marrying those girls so that you'll have two votes instead of one for Trump. Get the fuck out of here. You think that they don't think that way? Trust me, they do. Now, I've seen I've seen a uh, was it uh, Tommy Lahren? Tommy Lahren was 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 stroking this one for a while. It's like, well, women are going to get drafted. Well, why? Because men are man enough to go and pick up a gun and go out there and fight themselves. So now the little it's men's fault because they won't do it. So now the little ladies have to have to go and take care of things themselves. By the way, that's a narrative at, that traces fa- as far back as Dow Rock. If you think that the first time, if you think that like, what was it recently? I forget when it was like in 2016, there was supposed to be a measure on uh, some law or something. We're going to put women onto selective services. Didn't get on 2018, 2019, somewhere around there. Another one never happened. You're never, you're never going to conscript women, period. And I know that there's some, there's been recently, I think it was 2022 or something like that. There was recently something where they were saying, well, we're going to put women onto the selective services as a part of another bill. It's like added onto that bill here in the United States. And it's like, not going to happen. Didn't happen in 2016. Won't happen now. No one has a stomach for it. And the minute they even consider it, every pastor, every evangelical, you know, fire and brimstone preacher is going to say, it's men's fault that we have to rely on women. Now we have to like conscript women into the draft. Because you guys are manning up and doing it yourself. <laughs> Where's your, if you just marry these girls and you just find a girl, get married, have more kids than you can afford, then we wouldn't have to have this selective service bullshit, like anything that they can, they can conflate it with. So I think to answer your question, Proteus, is it's, it, there's, there is no red pill unless it's sort of underground. It always has been. I um I remember when uh, in 2019, right before all the shit went down with Anthony Johnson, um, I think one of the people don't realize this. That was June of 2019 when he decided to like go full retard. And when that was happening, all everybody, by the way, all of his co-conspirators and that he just basically fucked pretty much every single one of them, including Socrates. George Bruno, George Bruno sent me this picture. Yeah, I, should, I think I could probably dig it up. He sent me this picture of all these guys in 2019 who were part of the 21 convention. And it has like X's over all the faces that like, that no longer want to have anything to do with Anthony. And I think it was like back in 2021, 2022. And I just, I'll just a matter of time, man, just wait them out. That's all I really have to do was just like people who are pathological. Really, all you have to do is wait them out. Um, but uh, he wanted to go political. Like, I don't think Anthony Johnson has taken that MAGA hat off since 2017. I think he showers with the fucking thing. <laughs> like, that's how you remember Anthony Johnson. He's got this, make America great again. In every single video. Like, is he ever going to take the fucking hat off? Probably not. That's It's tribal affiliation, but he, he really kind of lost his mind back in like 2019 and wanted to go full on political. And that meant, uh, let's see, uh, Roman, um, Roman McClay. That meant, uh, go look him up. Uh, Roman McClay, um, go look up, uh, well, Jack Murphy, you guys already, already know. Uh, look at the people that he was associated with at that time and where they were then and where they are now. <laughs> Pat Stedman, where was he back then and where is he now? I'll let you guys, you connect the dots. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think that it needs to stay underground. And that experience, by the way, led me to say, you know what? The more you try to t- to bring the red pill sort of to the surface, the more potential you have for 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 catastrophes like Anthony Johnson, catastrophes like like Jack Murphy, catastrophes like you know, that like grifting. Like I, I would I would add Andrew Tate to that that list as well. Now they don't want to be, everybody wants to be red pill until it's not cool to be red pill anymore. Everybody hated the red pill. Everybody hates the red pill before they didn't hate the red pill. And now they love it again. And now they hate it again. It's like, what's paying the bills, the red pill. Oh, okay. I guess I'm on board. However, my one bright and shining star was Jedediah Bila, who is still on board. (laughs) 
She is in Montana, by the way, in case you guys were wondering if you wanted an update with, uh, with, uh, Jedediah Bila. I haven't, I talked to her, but we're like, we're like family friends now. I don't, I mean, I'll promote her stuff. And if she wanted to come on the show, if she wants to come down to Vegas, I'll be happy to have her. Uh, but she and her family have, uh, relocated to Montana. I'm not going to tell you where, but, um, Apparently she's very happy where she's at right now. And I'm, I'm very glad for her. And she's starting to sort of, you know, recirculate, get herself back into circulation right now, now that she's split from value tainment. And I think she's probably, I'm, I'm not going to say anything about it because I think she's probably better, a better person for her to explain why she separated from value tainment. And I, under, but I will say, I understand. <laughs> I understand. Oh, wait, I understand passport bros, but it comes with the international pack packing order pecking order uh plus after all they are all women too okay thanks if you're if you if you have no game in the united states you probably don't have much game in the philippines how can the ngo legally redirect your search traffic since it's youtube's own proprietary algorithms they can and they, oh, it depends on who's going to talk to who what gives the ngo the authority to do that they don't they don't have the authority to do any of that tom uh, they don't have the authority either to ask Elon Musk to participate with the software that they're developing for those social media platforms. They don't have to. Elon Musk, Elon Musk can say, hey, go pound salt. Go, f go fuck yourself, right? <laughs> Elon Musk. He could do that, but he could also say, you know what? We need to be, we need to be more concerned about these red pill incel guys because, you know, they're very, they're a danger. They're a menace to society. And so we got, we have to do it. They, they don't. They could comply on their own. There's nothing that they can do to force them to do that. And that's the whole point of it. Now, it might be that it goes, it's just a fart in the wind. They don't know, you know, they don't know that they're going to be successful about it, but that doesn't matter. I'll tell you why it doesn't matter. Because NGOs depend not on Elon Musk, not on YouTube, not on Google, not on Facebook, not on Instagram, not on, they don't depend on those guys. They depend on you. They depend on the taxpayer dollar via the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, that allocates funds to these NGO watchdogs. And you can be, I can form one. We should do one. We should make an NGO, a red pill NGO. We should watch out for people who are uh, promoting blue pill uh, degeneracy. We can make up, we can pull anything out of our asses and create an NGO and then apply for, I don't know, there's probably a tax exempt status. There's probably some like paperwork you have to do. Anybody can do it. The, uh, the one I was mentioning before, Divert Hate, has only been around since 2021. And it was out of a, it was out of a college. I can't remember which college it is. When I finally do the whole full breakdown video, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I'm actually going to be uh, re, um, republishing or, or uh, publishing on my sub stack an entire breakdown of all of this uh, and I'm going to make it free for everybody and everybody can, I'm going to make it free to comment on this one because I think it's that important, but, uh, essentially what it is, is you can make, anybody could be an NGO. And so there's like moonshot, there's uh divert hate. There's, uh, the center for control, for conf confronting center for countering digital hate. That's Imran Ahmed. Now, Here's how I found this out. This is why they don't have to do that. But what they do have to do is they have to say that they're actually doing something. So when I was made aware of divert hate, it isn't that they're actually doing these. They're, they're making this proprietary software so that it will work if they get the go, if they get the green light, whether or not that's a civil rights violation or it's going to violate the First Amendment or if I'm, I'm going to be like my right to free speech is abridged in some way because of that this is kind of immaterial to the fact that they're actually doing this and they're making money or they're being funded proving that they're doing something by just writing a report or doing a research study on incels. And they, the DHS doesn't care about that. They just want the data. And they want to think that they want in some way to think that, you know, something is sciency and they want to think that it's legit. And if it's got Dr. David Buss's stamp on it and it's got the University of Texas's stamp on it, and then you've got Forbes and you got Tim Pool and you got Chris Williamson all fronting and recruiting for it. Well, they sort of gives it an air of legitimacy, even though it's all bullshit. And it's all bullshit in the sense that all they're doing is like they're cherry picking from one fucking forum. And they're paying the participants. I say, well, oh, you know, um, universities always have always paid participants in, you know, research studies. Yes. In person. 
to come into the lab and do the do the fill out the thing. It's not an online thing. And there's an ethical sort of gray area between paying somebody to take an online survey for some sort of psychological research experiment. They were just talking about this. Like when I was held back in 2005, it was through email. I didn't have like the, the same kind of tech that we have now, but is it ethical to, or is it, are you going to sort of pollute the results or distort the results, corrupt the, the data? If you pay people to come in and take the survey when they, it's called the observe, observer effect, observing the process changes the process, right? It's part of academic rigor, which would be a podcast in itself. But part of that academic rigor, it's not that, you know, it's unheard of to pay participants to be in a study. That's they've been doing that for ages. The difference is it's online and anybody can do it. Whether you're an insa, I'm an insa, I could do, I could do it here. I'll pay. Like, I'm going to get what? 1250, 750. I'm going to get $25. Sure. I'll be an incel for 25 bucks. Fuck yeah. Let's do it. Go in there and answer them all like <laughs> as fucked up as I possibly can. Yeah, because you're it's you have to also control for the data sets being corrupted and the questions you're asking and everything else. And you're only getting it from one survey or only get it from one forum. And their sample size is somewhere between two and four hundred people. Like, what the fuck? Who the fuck is like, where's the academic? Rig? Dr. David Buss should know better than this. A first year psych student should know at least methodolo methodology. That's actually a, a part of a course is method, uh, what, experimental methods, I think is what it was. called. Hell, I took that course for fuck's sake, man. Knowing what academic rigor is, knowing methodology. Are you actually even, is the experiment that you've constructed, does it even find or does it look for what you think it's supposed to be looking for? You have to have people like tell you, yeah, okay, this sounds like it's, it's legit. Go for it. And then once you get the once you get the uh, once you get the results, then you've got to have peer review and then you've got to be published by hopefully an, a, an academic journal of some sorts. Nope. None of that shit. Just go fast track it right on out there. Most of the kinds of most research that you're that we look at, like when when I quote a study or it's Rolf Dengen or it's Rob Henderson or, or Steve Stuart Williams or anything, you're looking at you, you'll you'll notice this. A lot of the studies, they quote will be a year behind they won't be 2023 they won't be probably won't even be 2022 unless it's you know unless it's something very quantitative it'll probably be 2021 because it takes that long to go through academic rigor but that's not what they're doing with this shit so whenever i see somebody like alex from date psych or i see chris williamson like popping off about something that will costello said or now i guess it's going to be andrew thomas or whoever else I'm like, that is, I, I, the, the source is corrupt to begin with. And I think a lot of people, by the way, if you are, if you happen to be an incel or if you're a guy that has um, in any way sort of associated with incel.co or you, uh, or you, I don't know, gravitate towards that kind of stuff, understand those guys do not have your best interest in it. No, no 750 is worth, you know, fucking around with these guys because they're just going to, they're, they just want to turn you into their boogeyman. That's all they want to do. That's all that they want to take that data, sell it back to whoever, whatever NGO, whatever the DHS, whatever, just so they have something sciencey to to uh, to back up their reason for diverting my traffic or my and fresh or Brian from whatever podcast or whoever else that they think are creating these incels. We're not creating incels. If anything, I fucking have been against incel dumb for a very long time, but that doesn't matter because I'm just a boogeyman that they get paid with. So if you happen to be, if you see that and you're like of that mind, I would suggest one of two, th two things. One, don't participate in it at all and tell them to go fuck off or two, participate in it and just write as many fucked up answers as you possibly can. Corrupt their already corrupt methodology. Because these guys are manufacturing the data that they want so that they have a convenient foil so that when their guy doesn't get elected, it will be. Those incel guys, it'll be those red pill guys who it doesn't matter. Those red pill guys, it's, they, they didn't want to get married. They didn't want to play ball. They radicalize these guys. That's, that's what they want. Can they legally do that? No, they can't. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Much appreciated. Yeah. He's downstairs. He's doing all right. He's doing all right. I'm a little concerned about the strike too, but other than that, uh, the use of the term incel is a pejorative, pejorative, um, thereby discouraging honest participation in such NGO surveys. Yes. How clumsy and nearsighted. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing. Like I, I've asked these guys and they, nobody wants to answer at this. 
I don't, I haven't been blocked, but I know a lot of people who have been blocked for asking similar questions saying, why are you affiliated with an, this NGO? Why are, why is an NGO the one that is paying the 750 for you? And you want to say that it's actually funded by the university. Yeah. The experiment is, but the money that they're using to pay the incels to participate in the survey, that's NGO dollars. Go look it up. I did. And you know what? They're hoping nobody does. That's why. That's where the money is deriv- derived from. Like, I, know I, I'll, I could go to Swansea and show you, the, show you the links for that. The long and the short of it is, is like, why would you, first of all, it's seven, seven dollars. You want seven fifty? I'll give you fucking seven <laughs> fifty. I'll, I'll give you seven fifty not to participate in it. How's that? Yeah. Uh, what's worse, debating against a feminist or a religious zealot? Um, a religious zealot. Feminism is, uh, I think, is easier. It's, it's more cut and dried. There's still a, both of them are ideologies. But let's see. I, I, for, I don't know who I'm quoting right now. I'm paraphrasing a quote. Um, People with questions don't frighten me. People with no questions scare the shit out of me. Religious zealots have don't generally do not have questions. And I I'm kind of on the fence about like trying to debate people who are so questionless in their convictions. And I I'm seeing what's known as, and I, I mentioned this in the, in my fourth book in religion, the rational male religion, those guys don't talk about religion, dude. I spent three years writing a book about religion. It took me a long time. I put a lot of effort into this. It's the best cited book I have, please, man. Just read it. Do me, do me the solid here. The, the, the religious zealots for sure feminists i can handle in fact it's by the way i think that is kind of a, a it's a bubba miza you know what a bubba miza is it's a it's a folk tale it's a it's a it's a story that ain't true it's yiddish by the way oh no rolls jew a bubba miza it's a wives tale it's bullshit because feminism no one like to identify as a feminist in 2023 in the 21st century period is meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. You can be a religious zealot and people can pretty much understand that. But even the religious zealots, they're feminists too. <laughs> because if you were born after 1965, odds are somewhere along your development, your psychological, educational, I don't know, personal personality development, you were in some way influenced by feminist ideology. Myself included, by the way. I, I'll be the first. A casual sex? Hmm. Yeah, you You probably were. Did you watch any, uh, let's see, did you watch any of the teenage movies in the 80s, like Pretty in Pink or Breakfast Club or Last American Virgin or what else was there? St. Elmo's Fight? No, I suck. I hated that movie. <laughs> um. They go to, oh, weird science. <laughs> um, anything with uh, either Matthew Broderick or uh, Anthony Michael Hall, you were probably indoctrinated by feminism. <laughs> yeah, that's how far it goes back. Oh, Rolla was born in Woodstock. No. Yeah, I was born the year Woodstock was. Ha- was it 1968? Was Woodstock? I was born that year, idiot. <laughs> Anyone, anyone over like anyone over 40 uh, was at Woodstock, apparently, to to Zoomers and millennials. Yeah, uh, I would definitely I, feminine. Everyone's a feminist, even I had a, by the way, the uh, the whole thing about that calendar with the, the trad fems, that ought to be your first clue. Conservative women, absolutely feminist. In fact, that whole debate or one of the people like it was who was it? Lauren Chen? Who else? There's a bunch. Of, I can't even keep track of the names anymore. Ashley St. Clair or whatever. I can't even keep track of these chicks. But it's here is. Hey, guys. Here, hey, fellas. Here's a here's a conserve ladies of conservative TP USA calendar with girls in bikinis. <gasps> my stars and garters can clutch my pearls in bikinis with American flags on them. Apparently, I don't know how many. I don't know if there's any like rebel flags in there because I don't know. But these are apparently are the cons- ladies of conservatism calendar. I wonder who was on July. <laughs> They're all upset because it's like, oh, if you guys are buying this calendar, it means you're not you're not looking at your own woman. It means you guys, because clearly if you're a conservative guy, 
you should find a woman, get married, have more babies than you can afford, love God and, and vote for whoever the Rep- is on the Republican ticket. You shouldn't be looking, even if they are conservative, my God. But then in, like what, what it gets me is like, and if it's not an election year and there is no calendar or anything like that, the first thing women like trad film, traditional feminist, feminine trad con women will say is like, well, you know, us trad con women are so much prettier than those, those liberal wokesy feminist progressivist women. They have under armpit hair and man, their, their hair is fuchsia and, and look at the tats and look at the, you know, they'll find the worst example they can of like some, some progressivists, but they don't realize that they are just as feminist as Lena Dunham. They just in a different fashion, like in a different context. And that context comes to the surface when there's a calendar of, you know, hot chicks and bikinis that are supposed to be conservative too. And now it's like, mm, it's like, it's like that meme where they have to press the button, <laughs> like, you know, press the button, uh, hot conservative girls, da, 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 you know, conservative women are hotter than hotter than liberal women, or your husband should be like only looking at you. <laughs> That's the other button. Well, the Ashley St. Clair is the type uh, TPUSA puts on a literal pedestal. Of course they do. And also ex only fans, I believe Gia McCool, who I actually like quite a bit. And I like she's like texting me back and forth. Uh, I like her well enough, but I think she's a product right now um, until she, until otherwise uh, notified. Uh, she's really kind of a product. Uh, ex porn girl and now wants to be a, a, a conservative sweetheart and that's another one of Rollo Tomasi's famous prognostications for 2024. Ladies, if you really want your brand to take off in 2024, wear a crucifix necklace around and have big titties. That's that's your, that's a secret to, to engagement success in the trad film sphere that's coming up. And guys, watch for it. And, and the girls that are out right now, like, like uh, Ashley St. Clair, I don't want to say Gia McCool because she's not really, kind of there, I guess. But there's a lot of them right now. I name, Names I can't even like remember. But there's a lot of these girls that are sort of coming up out of the, like Le, uh, Lila Rose. She's she's always been this way, right? These women are coming out of the fucking woodwork right now. Because, and and notice this. Uh, what was, what's that? Nikki Haley. Oh, like watch Nikki Haley. You want a, a good example of a conservative feminist? Look no further than Nikki Haley. <laughs> That's what I mean when I say the sisterhood uberalis, the sisterhood above all. It doesn't matter what race they are. It doesn't matter what ethnicity. doesn't matter nationality. does not matter uh, political stripe. does not matter what the religion is. There is only one tribe, and it is the sisterhood. So when you see, like, how can Nikki Haley say the thing she does? She's a feminist. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been saying that for freaking ever. I said, I called this out in my fourth book, In Religion. It's the sisterhood Uber Alice. It's the goddess movement is what I call it. That's the religious side of it anyways. It's the goddess movement. Whether it's, you know, conventional Protestant Christianity or Catholicism or Islam or Judaism or Hinduism or <laughs> there's only one religion that I couldn't really tag feminism in. And that was like Sikhs. <laughs> and maybe, I don't know. I don't know enough about them, but Sikhs got my vote, by the way. Um, I think if I, I think if I was to like convert from whatever I am right now, it would probably be to Sikhism. I think they got it going. I'd have to like wear the thing and grow a beard. I'm, I'm sure but they let me in. They probably would. Uh, I say that in 2024, no more MSM, no more mainstream media. Okay. No more Pierce Morgan, no more Dr. Phil BBC. Those people can talk about the rib. They won't I, I, Here, You know what? Cryptic cool. Here's another, you won't have to worry about that. They would, they won't want to talk about that because the red pill is already their foil. They're already the fall guy. So if, Let's see uh, if they want uh, not to give more fuel. Uh, what do you think? Uh, again, I agree with you, but it won't be because we're like, okay, you know what? We're going to all lock arms and not go on Pierce Morgan. <laughs> Trust me. If Pierce Morgan called me yet tomorrow, I'd be on the next flight to London or wherever the fuck he is. I would do it. Dr. Phil ain't going to call. Trust me on this. I, I with 100% certainty, Dr. Phil will not be calling me again. <laughs> that I can tell you that I can, that promise I can keep. Um, but I don't think you're gonna have to worry about that because the red pill, I'm, I'm going to make a, a, a going to make a, another 
prediction here. When the judgment comes down, the verdict comes down for the Tate brothers. I can't see them getting out of this right now. I really don't. And people will say, well, it's because the Matrix got them or whatever. I can't see them getting out of this mountain of forensic evidence against them. I don't know how, I don't know what's going to happen. I hope they beat the rap. I hope they beat the odds. I will say that right now. I hope they beat the odds. I don't think they will, but I hope they do. But in any account, once that verdict comes down, you will see all of these people, Patrick Bet David, for example, you're going to see all these people who are on board with, you know, the parts that Tate was all about when it came to the red pill, because people still see Tate as sort of like red pill. Now they want to say he's red pill adjacent, which is horseshit. But you'll see the people who are like real, like people who are outside the sphere who wanted some of that Tate juice. We never knew ye. It will be, they'll be like Judas, right? They'll be like, uh, like, uh, uh, was it the, the cock will crow three times before the sunrise? <laughs> was it a uh, Peter? <laughs> was it Peter who denied Christ? We never knew ye guaranteed <laughs> take that to the fucking bank. And if they don't, they'll just be like, Oh, well, you know, it's, it's the matrix and they'll move on. And people won't even talk about it six months later. And the only time they will refer to it. And by the way, that's why I'm the reason I'm bringing this up is because Pierce Morgan was on board with that. Tucker Carlson is what interviewed him twice. Now, um, Look at the people who were like uh, you, the, the, the names you mentioned. Hell, Dr. Phil didn't want Roll Tomasi. He wanted Tate on that show. <laughs> I know I'm the one he asked to get on. Well, their producers asked me to get him on the show. I was the understudy. I was the proxy for Tate on that show. And I can't get Tate. Okay, well, who's this Rolo guy? <laughs> I guess Myron wasn't available. I don't know. Um, but, uh, I think you're going to see that that's going to take care of itself in 2024. Uh, Pierce Morgan will will turn turn tail on anything red pill, anything pro masculine, anything that smells like manosphere. Even Chris Williamson, who was all you know, kind of at least sort of red pill agnostic, right up until July. Well, really, right up until May, <clears throat> but right up until all the incel studies and all this other bullshit started floating around. And he started rubbing elbows with fucking Alex from Date Psych. Now it's like, I don't want the Manosphere stink on me until I do. Until he wants to talk about like Manosphere red pill things and then wants to come back and and be a part of it again. And let me explain this also to you, because this is sort of a really long term, you know, Rolo Damas, Rolo Nostradamus, Rolo Damas prediction is this. All the people who are leaving the red pill or want to be red pill adjacent or all the people who made a shit ton of money off the red pill who pivot out of it will pivot back into it sometime around mm, spring of 2025, certainly before summer of 2025, because the the election cycle is a grift. It's like, hey, man, good times are here. Let's let's go make MAGA hats. Let's go make T-shirts. Let's go make cross necklaces, apparently. Um, let's go do all these things that are going to, you know, because that's where everybody's headspace is at right now. And that's where they're going to go. They're not about the red pill. They're not about men helping men. They're not about that at all. They, they would like you to think they are because that's what was paying the bills. How do I know that? I could tell you, I'll give you two examples right now. One was Jedediah Bela. I met Jedediah in, I think it was latter half of June, maybe the beginning of July in, um, uh, 2022. And I went on her show. I was one of the first guests, really. I want her on her new on her studio show. And I went on there and we had this conversation. It was really good. I, I fell in love with Jed. And she knows that. I love I love me some Jed. And uh, that's when I think she sort of had her red pill moment, right? Her red pilling. I went on there. She started looking because she was talking about Myron and Fresh. And I said, look, I know. I, I understand the, sh the shill right here. I understand the griff, but it's like, if you're going to tell me that you don't know much about Myron and Fresh and then for the next 45 minutes to an hour, you're going to tell me everything you think they're about. Like, doesn't that sound a little off to you? Then go and educate yourself, please. And that's what she did to her credit. Bravo. Jed did. And you know what she did? She changed her format as a result of that. So she starts getting like people like, uh, well, unfortunately, Destiny. She gets Pearl on there. She gets, uh, but she's had Sterling Cooper. She's had Justin Waller. I remember that interview. Um, she's had Mike on. She had me on again with Mike. Um, I think who else she said? She, uh, she had Hunter Avalone on there, <laughs> maybe against her better judgment. Um, but she, you know, she's still a conservative. She was on The View. 
She was on the view with fucking whoop. She was the token conservative on the view when, when McC- uh, McCain, what's her name? Cindy McCain left the show and then she was, came in there for eight months and then left, right. Or got kicked, I guess. Yeah, she's told me some stories about that, that I don't want to relate, but anyways. Um, yeah. I bet her format changed. I at least feel, and she said this on several occasions. Like I was instrumental in the success of, or, you know, the come up of her show from July to right around December of 2022, it took her that long to get 100,000 subs. She got her little silver plaque, just like I have, right? Or platinum plaque, whatever that is. Because she changed her format. Same thing with, here's a second example, Adam Sosnick. Adam Sosnick had a show that was just based on like uh, finances, sauce cast, and it was money cast, right? How to make money, how to have a what, millionaire mindset, whatever the fuck it was. Then he started doing sort of semi-red pill shows, like panel shows on every Thursday, um, on every, every Thursday from February, 2022 until well, really now he's still doing it too. And again, I got nothing against Adam himself. I just don't like who he works for. And I, I had to sort of sort that, sort that out for myself earlier this year. But I think Adam is, Adam is a different animal when he's away from valuetainment. When he was on, uh, access Vegas, so people go, wow, what happened to Adam? He's changed. Like, no, that's, that's Adam. <laughs> he has to be. He has to be different on value payment because that's where his that's where his paycheck comes from. I get it. I understand. But um, so, anyways, uh, but he started out as a finance cast finance, like it's all about money, sauce money, or whatever it was with the dollar signs, right? But now it's now everything. I basically changed the name of the show to Sauce Cast because they're no longer about money and they're all about what? Doing panel shows, doing shit like Myron and Fresh, doing and in a different format, in a bigger stage, or probably more well funded, maybe a little bit better. I don't know. I wouldn't say better polished because Myron and Fresh really go to town on theirs. Certainly have upped their game, but they weren't doing that before I arrived. He wasn't doing that before. Hey, when I got on, on in February of 2022, I got on PBD. I met Adam. Then we hit it off really well. And then that's when, in fact, that same night, I invited him to come to uh, to Fresh and Fit when they were still at the old studio. I introduced him to that. He's been on several times. He's they have had collabs with Value Tainment, even as recent as this year. That never would have been facilitated if Roll Tomasi hadn't been involved in that. Period. I'm pretty confident in saying that. And then also, I'm the one that got him Justin Waller. I'm the I had Torsha on there a few times. Hi, Tor. Tori. I had Torsha on there a few times. Um, I've had other people. I've, I've pushed people into that show. I've had, a, what's his name? Derek Thomas for a fitness guy. I've had him on there. Um, i trying to think. Uh, Sterling's been on. I think who else has been on SauceCast. But anyways, it changed, basically changed his format because that's what was going on. It was better than the culture war. It was better than money talk. It was better than whatever Jedediah Bila was doing prior to pivoting into that. Now, to Jed's credit, she's not pivoting out of it, as far as I can tell. She's actually on board, so I'm happy to say that. I don't know, you know, maybe maybe Sauce is in, maybe he's not. I don't know. I think he's doing whatever Valuetainment really wants him to do. And I'm going to make one more prediction here. Ooh, you guys aren't going to like this one. You're not going to like this one. Here's prediction for 2024. I predict Natalie, Natalia, Natalia will take over SauceCast. I I'm, I should give you a deadline. And I just say by, I want to give you a little bit extra. Uh, let's say by October of 2024, Natalia will have taken over SauceCast. I don't know what it'll be called, but she's already doing the booking for him. She's already doing all the logistics for him. I guarantee you she will in some way. And she's like, she's she went from being like the producer to being the co-host booking all of destiny's angels booking on melina and angela knight and everybody who's every time you've seen conflict on sauce cast with like say donovan sharp or mld or anybody else on there even um the the, the fiora nick nick fiora all those guys she's involved in that in some way certainly certainly with mld and certainly with uh with uh, donovan that conflict, all the people that all those bookings and everything else now is done. But she's she's got picking. She's scheduling the Uber drivers for us right now. I was the last time I was there. I'm like, damn, she's doing a lot of stuff. But my liaison wasn't her before. Now it is. She's doing the logistics. I think it's just one short step from her to from going from that to being the host of that show. And maybe that's what Adam wants. I don't know. But Natalia will take will take the reins in 2024. I could be wrong. For Ned and Ned's leg and Anna's kibble. Thank you very much. You guys were 
you get thank you for that forty dollars. Yo, Marco, Marco. You get because you remembered my other dog's name. Uh, let's see what you got. Thank you, uh, DB Skills. I got two from you. Uh, nothing, no, no message, but thank. I do appreciate it. Hey, Rolo, you enjoy your content. I'm in the fitness industry and recently had an objectionable and experienced dating single mom. Would it be out of my niche to create around this topic or should I just stick to fitness? Um, are you for it or are you against it? <sighs> dating a single mom is different than like marrying a single mom. I think that most guys are sort of averse. Like there's, I think there's a natural aversion to uh, like revulsion. I only use revulsion because there is a concept in psychology called sexual revulsion and women tend to have way more sexual revulsion than men do. But I think one of the things where one area where men tend to be a little bit more um, discerning, let's just say is, is getting involved with a woman who has already had kids. Because it's not, it's it's already a proven, like for men, it might be different, right? If you got a, a guy who has, he's a single father, that's almost an advantage. Whereas a single mother is a disadvantage because it's a resource drain. And I know that that sounds horrible. It sounds dehumanizing. It's not me. It's, I'm just saying that that's the psychological predisposition of guys because it's not your DNA. And some other guy, some other guy who should have the responsibility of the parental investment responsibility of that kid isn't taking that. And so therefore it's on you. So for you to even have a kid, you've got to already invest resource wise in that child. That's why she's a bad bet for paternity. Now, that's not to say that there's not some ethic, like maybe your convictions are religious or maybe you're just in love with her. Okay. Got it. But you have to get past that. There's a natural innate revulsion or hesitancy even for men to get involved with single moms. And it's not because of those red pill guys, just innate. But um, I'm gonna tell you, like, Professor, I'm gonna tell, like, I'm looking at your avatar. I would say stick to fitness, my friend. And I'll tell you why. Because when I am organizing things and I'm doing things for Access Vegas or my own brands or my own, in my own interests, I, not just interested in what I do, like, which is game, I guess, or it's like red pill theory, uh, whatever it is that I do, intersexual dynamics, which everybody loves to lift that. that I'm glad I popularized that term. Um, love to, I, I, whatever it is that I do, you know, the, the, I would say that, that it falls under the game, like money, muscles, and game. I would say what I do definitely falls under game, right? If, if there's a catch all, right? Money, I've got I've got a lot of people for money. I've got uh, I've got Kiyosaki, Hartman. I've got Gammon. I've got McElroy. I've got Miguel. I got Charlie. Um, I've got a lot of people for 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 that. What I don't have is a lot of guys for fitness who are red pill guys for fitness. Now you probably have. I tried to make inroads this year. You probably have seen the interview I did with Hide Yamagishi and George. Uh, I forget his last name. I got him from American Wellness. That's his kind of his thing, uh, his trainer, they were his, his lifting partner and was a fantastic interview. If you have not seen that, it's like in my, it's in my video videos, um, go and check that out. But it's Hide Yamagishi, who is the IFBB world champion, who reigning champion from Romania was the last, that's where he went last. Um, he's been making the rounds. He was in Japan not too long ago. Uh, I would very much love to do more work with Hide, Hide Tata Yamagishi, um, in the future, 50 years old, by the way, I, I, I definitely want to do that. I want to get into, uh, I, I'd like to talk to his, uh, his training partner, uh, George, who is also into like, uh, let's just say hormone optimization <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Uh, also Thor Markinson's and, uh, and, uh, Drew Bay. But I think there's a lot more room for fitness guys for in the money muscles and game like trifecta. There's more room in the muscle side of things. And I think that that might be your strength. So. I would definitely stick to that. And holy mother Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mean to hit that last one, but thank you very much for that, man. I'm much appreciated for my bell. And all, and every last cent of that will go to Ned's medical bills, which every time I get a day bandage change, it's 200 bucks. <laughs> much appreciated. Love you too. Thank you. Have a good, you too. Have a good uh, new year. Thank you very much, James, for your contributions. 
Uh, just like in Scarface, they need to point their finger at someone and say, that's the bad guy. Yep. Enjoying the collabs with Andrew Wilson. I like Andrew quite a bit. Uh, I don't, I know we're not going to, um, I know we're not going to agree on everything and I don't want to because that leaves room for like discussion. We have a really good discussion. When I was on his show, Jay Dyer was on the show and I had no intent on getting into like this really philosophical thing, but we, that's where we go. That's, that's where we ended up. Oh, you want to That's these? nasty. It is nasty, right? Isn't it nasty? Oh, I love that one. That's my favorite one. That's uh, by the way, I introduced that this year. Uh, the true black pill is that women genuinely don't believe that children need father need to be father. The medium is the message. It's women ending relationships. Primarily, yes, women are more responsible for ending relationships than men are. One hundred percent true. Uh, when is the next Access Vegas? Glad you asked. The next Access Vegas will be uh, on uh, January eleventh. And that's going to be we're, we're we're doing something new where I'm going to freshen up the look of the site. I'm going to be doing uh, we got we have merchandise that is available now. Uh, it's already on the Access Vegas. If you don't have you haven't subscribed to Access Vegas, why not? Um, but go ahead and do so. Uh, we're we're probably going to be doing a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to be a little more proactive, I think, on the Access Vegas side of things. Uh, we we're just this. I think 2023, we're getting it off the ground. And now it's off the ground. It is the number one podcast in Vegas right now, minus maybe a couple of other podcasts. But in our niche, there's nobody doing what we do. And uh, we're getting to the point right now where Mike and I get recognized for being on Access Vegas. It used to be that people would recognize me in like clubs and casinos and stuff like that because I'm Rolo. But now uh, even Domo, our, our uh, team Domo, right, uh, our, our resident, point, well, one of the resident porn stars that we have. Uh, I love Domo. I really, really love Domo. But she is like a fan favorite. And she's been telling me recently, like she she texts me all the time. She's got, by the way, she's a single mom. So like there's almost like a family thing we got going on now too. But she'll tell me, she'll text me every now and then. She'll say she's been in the clubs or a strip club or something like that. Or she's been working and somebody will come up to him and say, you know, Rolo. <laughs> It's like a third part. It's like a, uh, a third party uh, uh, Rolo sighting, you know, Hey, why aren't you on? And so she's known now for being on access Vegas. Same with Maya Allegra. Thank you very much. My red pill muse of 2023. Um, she's uh, well known for being one of our access girls. And um, I think it's great when, when Domo hits me up and says, Hey, somebody in the club has said, uh, you know, recognize me from the show. And not from like, not from her porn movies, from the show, right? And I don't know if she's even active in porn anymore, but she does strip. But I'm like, well, that's great. You know, so now the girls that are part of the panel are now what we call access girls and they are getting recognized as such, which is great. And she's not, she's one of probably at least half a dozen girls who, who hit me up and say, hey, I got recognized because I was on the show. That's what I want. I want to get that because I think the, it means that people are like invested in the conversation enough to know that Domo was actually an access girl. So I'm really pleased with that. Oh, what do we got here? Let's see. I read all your books and bought my bros, your books. Thank you very much for Christmas. Oh, good. And uh, please keep it up. <laughs> I've been uh, wondering how to use the red pill in the books that I'm trying to write. Okay. They're all dark fantasy. Okay, good. And, but I don't know how to apply it to the stories. Any tips? Okay. Well, first of all, I, I have to do the same thing, by the way, because I am actually a fiction writer on top of everything else. I make my, that there's always at least one male character that is sort of like the happy go lucky, like a Captain Kirk or the Han Solo that's unapologetically masculine, old school cut from that cloth. And then there's no effort to, I think the best way to sort of incorporate Red Pill into fiction anyways it's a dark fantasy i guess too is to be unapologetic have a characters that are unapologetically masculine in the sense that like they're not there to be corrected for their masculinity they don't need bad bitch to 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 show them up they don't need correction if anything, I would write a strong, however you want to do it, right? Because you're in dark fantasy. Okay. It might be a little more sinister for that. You might want to rely on more like uh, dark triad personality traits for your character, or characters, whatever. But let's just say, so that's one side. The other thing is, is if you had like, say a pro-masculine, very, a good guy, like a Captain America or even a Tony Stark, like an Iron Man or something like that. Don't have them be corrected by women. Have them correct women. 
like write it from that perspective, write it from the perspective that this guy is so in control of his shit and so in control of his frame. He's the one that's saving women from themselves because that's a narrative you will never see come out of Marvel or Disney or anything that's you know mainstream right now. Make sure that your characters, your main male characters are um, unapologetically masculine and are rewarded for being so are positive and maybe in dark fantasy, maybe in a different kind of way, but are have a sort of a, a direction, right? Instead of having to have women save them from themselves. I think that's probably the best advice I can give you. And what else do we got here? What's Tori doing? Oh, Torsha just sent me a picture. Hi, Tori. Should I show this to you? <laughs> she sends me. She loves me. Tori still loves me. Hi, Tori. I love you, too. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, Rolo, longtime fan from Southern Ohio. Oh, cool. Uh, okay. Uh, should I tell you a story about Ohio? <laughs> Thanks for all you do. Happy New Year's to you and yours. The, the, um, my band, Trial of Ascension. Um, we use a, uh, we use a, a guy out there for our mix down. We have the good, I think it's called Empyrean, Empyrean Studios. It's in Ohio. I don't know exactly where it is exactly, but, uh, that's another thing that's coming up in 2024 uh plans wise uh my band will be releasing at least one if not two eps during 2024 we're front loading them we have one already done and in the can so we can actually be like you know doing our doing our, our creative thinking and not be sort of beholden to a schedule uh but those are coming out very soon um, that should be coming soon. And we do, uh, we've been talking about this. I don't know if we're going to do it or not, but we've been talking about actually going to Ohio to the, the studio where we do the mix downs and actually recording out there and taking a road trip and making a big deal out of it. So that might happen at some point. We'll see. Uh, have you seen a movie called nocturnal animals? No, uh, it's about a woman that leaves her broke struggling writer boyfriend for a rich guy. <laughs> Sounds like every, uh, Hallmark Christmas show. <laughs> Low-key red pill masterpiece. Yeah, you want another low-key red pill masterpiece? Go watch a movie called Blue Valentine. I think it has Jake Gyllenhaal in it. Not, maybe not. Maybe it's Ryan Gosling. I don't know. Old, old. Well, now it seems old anyways. It's like probably like late 2000s, I think. Uh, Blue Valentine. Is it? Is it like, are you going to learn a red pill lesson? Like, is it teaching you red pill Rollo? No, it's not. It's teaching you the opposite of it. But when you watch it, you'll understand why I say Blue Valentine is a red pill movie. You will learn your, you learn your lesson the hard way. Happy New Year to Ned and the Godfather. Thank you very much. I appreciate you, my friend. Hey, Dr. Thunder. Where's Dr. Thunder? We need, I need a sound drop for you, too. You're goddamn right. Thank you, Dr. Thunder. Dr. Thunder is one of my musician friends. I tend to make really good musician friends as a result of being in this sort of niche. He's probably going <laughs> to, Dr. Thunder is going to hit me up on Instagram and say, when are we going to jam? He's by the way, Dr. Thunder actually is a doctor. He's a doctor of music. He's fucking great at everything he plays. He play, now correct me if I'm wrong. I know he plays saxophone, clarinet plays bass, like crazy plays all kinds of different guitars, like six, seven, eight string guitars. Most of them are headless too, which I'm, I'm even more impressed by. I only have one headless guitar. Um, really good musician and teaches uh, music. So go check out Dr. Thunder. He's on, um, I think he's on Instagram. Uh, been in Austin for two years and made no social circle. My excuse is that I work a ton, but make $250,000. Okay. Uh, I have an opportunity to move to South Florida, but will work the same amount. Should I go? Yes. The you fish where the, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I'm not going to tell you that. Austin, is your month wanting to move to South Florida based on something you want to do? You're, you're faced with a decision, uh, K Dog. You're, you're faced with the decision. Okay. What do you want? How is this going to affect you? I can't tell you how it's going to affect you. Only you can tell you how it's going to affect you. So, mental point of origin. Once again, you have to be your own mental point of origin. Don't ask me permission to go, but I will tell you this. Make some considerations here. Are you going because you want to get laid and you want, if you want to find a chick? You would think it's a, a target rich environment, right? Do you want to go there because you want to fish where the fish are? I love shit. I just love the location. I would, I would, um, I would consider having a house in Florida. I don't know if I would like, 
take a permanent residence there. I've already lived in Florida before. I lived in Florida from 2005 to 2013, Orlando area, and uh, worked there in the liquor industry for a long time. But, uh, and I love, I love Florida. I love being by the beach. That's me. I, I'm Southern California. I was born and raised in Southern California. I was born and raised in Pasadena, California. I spent a lot of time in San Gabriel Valley, Sierra Madre, Arcadia, Monrovia, uh, Glendale. I worked in Glendale for quite some time. I lived in North Hollywood for some time. Um, and I spent my summers in Huntington Beach and all of the beaches up and down that part of the coast. So Seal Beach, um, uh, Pearl, Pearl, um, Carlsbad. Uh, up and down that co I know that's far further away, but there's uh, uh, what the other, what's the other one? There's a really good one. I'm trying to remember the name of oh, Oceanside. Is really good. I'm trying to think where 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 did I surf when I was younger? Carlsbad, Calabasas. That's down towards San Diego, though. Um, certainly Huntington Beach, Laguna, Long Beach. There's no surf in Long Beach. But, um. I like being by the beach. I like, I, I, I was a California guy. I still am. I love California. I, I, I can't live there, but I love California. I love Catalina Island. Love Catalina. Spent a lot of time in Catalina Island when I was a kid. Um, but uh, it's kind of up to you, man. Like, where do you want to go? Where do you feel what, like it's on you? You're, you're your mental point of origin. So I, don't ask me for permission, but look at the, look at the ups and the, look at the tops, top side, right? Look at the ups and the downs. If you think you can make $250,000 in Miami, that doesn't go as far as it does in Austin. I don't know what the cost of living is in Austin, but I sure as fuck know what it is in Brickle. So, so um, take that into consideration. What's your, how are you going to, what's your change in lifestyle going to be for, for making that shift? That's the best I can do. But I mean, look at it from, look at it from a pragmatic perspective first. And maybe it's not Miami you want to go to. Maybe you want to go to a Deerfield Beach. Maybe you want to go to Cape Coral. Maybe you want to go to uh, Coral Gables. I don't know. Um, let's see. Uh, Fort Myers. Oh, you want to go on the Gulf side. I don't know. If you want to fish where the fish are, I mean, shit. I mean, you, why not go to Vegas? Why not go to California? Why like LA? Why not go? If that's the, the point, there's probably cheaper places you could go if your goal is to fish where the fish are. And also, I don't know how old you are. Uh, hey, Rolo, I'm turning 40 this week. What advice would you give guys going into their fourth decade? <sighs> okay, so 20, in my 20s, this is a good, this is a good question. In my 20s, I was all over the place, right? All I wanted to do was get laid. That's it. I, I will be the first one to say, I openly admit, all I want to do is fuck. I just want to have sex and I want to have a good time. And all I was really thinking about from the time I was like 19 until I was about 20, 26 ish was when's the next gig. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be in music in some way. And I was, and I'm happy to say that I was involved in all that. You know, the, it was the latter half anyways of the uh, sort of the Hollywood LA metal scene. Uh, during that time, from the time, let's say 1980, well, I guess 1988, 89 in there, right up until 94 ish, 95. And um, I think a lot of people think that like when you're a musician, like if you're a successful musician in some way, and I mean, like just relatively speaking, like being a musician today is nothing like it used to be like when I was coming up and there was no money then. And there's really no money now, more or less. There's more potential for money back then, but now I now I think it's a labor of love more than anything. But um, I think a lot of people think you just go up there and you shake your ass and you play guitar and you you that's it. No, you have to know how to write a song. You have to know your instrument. You have to know you got to know psychology. The people who are in your band, you have to know how recording gets done. You have to know how uh, how how management works. How to get a gig. How to how to play a show, how to be entertaining on stage. You think of all the things that you have to know. It's like a college fucking course, like how to be a rock star, right? All of these things. It's not just like, oh, I'm going to just pick up. You're not going to be Kurt Cobain and just pick up a guitar and just strum it. And that, then people, you know, girls are going to throw their panties at you. You have to know people. You have to network. You have to know where you're going to, where the next club is. You have to know who the manager is. You got to, maybe you have a road manager. Maybe you don't. Um, you have a roadie, you have a guitar tech, maybe you got that. I don't know. It escalates as you go up and, and stuff. And so I think a lot of people think that it's just, oh, those guys are just degenerate rock stars and blah, blah, blah. And for the most part, maybe they are. But uh, there's a lot more to it than just, you know, pick up a guitar and know three chords. Um, but 
when I was in my twenties, that's all I really wanted to do is I was doing it because I thought, Hey, maybe I can have some sort of future in this. And I started actually getting more into graphic design because I was more in the promotion side of, of the bands I was in at that time. But I was all over the, the map, man. I was just doing different things and, and, you know, I didn't really have much direction like a lot of guys do today. And then I started in my thirties, like right around 28. That's when I got married was on 28. Um, I started, that's when I went back to college. I went back to school, sort of got my shit together. I woke up, I shook myself awake and got my ass together. Uh, by the time I was 30, I had a kid. Um, and then in my thirties, I think that's really when you're sort of building your foundation. That's when you're sort of building like, here, what am I going to do to sort of the, the base of my empire gets built really, I think. I mean, you could do it earlier, but it really gets built in your 30s. And then by your time you're in four in your 40s, I think that's really you're sort of building out, fleshing out your what you're what's going to be your empire at that at that point. I'm just using empire as like a sort of a loose term, your frame. Um, you probably won't really come into your own like peak potential until you're like 36, 37, 38, somewhere in there. And that's when you start hitting your stride and you know whatever else but i think in your 40s is really when you're sort of like really developing something on top of that foundation and then remember that i i mean this is just me i'm not saying it works the same way for everyone else but like i didn't publish my first book until like 10 years ago so i would have been 43 years old no 45 i would have been 45 years old in 2013. so 45 years old is when i published the rational mail at 45. And, you know, despite what, oh, I don't know, some dude named Destiny will tell you, I actually wrote the book myself and wrote all my, all the sequels myself as well, uh, because we didn't had, didn't have chat GPT. We didn't have ghostwriters back then. It wasn't, that was not the way things are. And I am an actual author, not a copywriter. Thank you very much. I have helped people actually do the formatting and the and I've helped I've done intros to other people's books. I have done covers of other people's books because that's my forte. That's my you know what I I did for a living for quite some time. So um, yeah, something I do. But I think in your forties, don't let anybody tell you that if you haven't if you haven't got like raging success by the time you're thirty six, you're doomed. There's a lot of guys who like become like successful not until they're 50 because what they become successful at required them to have the skills and the life experience so that they could do and be successful later on. That's the, you want to talk about one of the beauties of being a dude is that's possible. That's you have that potential. I never set out to be an author, certainly not at 45 years old. I would much rather have had like, you know, been making six figures when I was in my twenties or my thirties, but I'm glad I, it happened the way it did because I was ready for it then and I could handle it. And I knew what I was, I knew what I was going to do once I started seeing, you know, success sort of like pile upon other successes and how can I parlay this and how can I develop this that much more? Uh, I would say if you're turning 40, um, make sure that you learn from not just your mistakes and your, your downfalls and your zeroing out and know that you will be again, most likely but also from your successes. So when you, when you are successful at something, it's almost more imperative for you to say, why was I successful at this? Because for the most part, people go, Hey, I figured it out. I beat the final boss in the video game. Thanks Rollo. Bye. I don't need you anymore. And that's when you need it the most, because we don't, we, we tend to rarely question our successes because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. We always agonize over Why did I do wrong? How could I do this better? Why do, why was I defeated in the boxing ring? Right. Well, it's your technique. Let's work on this. Right. You'll, you'll be more invested in your own success when you have had a failure than you will when you actually have, you know, you won the championship. You have to be better. Th and by the way, that's another, here's here. You want some more advice? Here you go. You're only as good as your last success. Lord knows I have learned that one. My friend, you are only, you cannot rest on your laurels. People will say, well, Rollo, man, you're all yoked, man. How'd you, you must be on juice. You must be on TRT. You must be like, I'm, well, I'm doing TRT. Yes. And I'm working out more. And then I'm rubbing elbows with guys like Hide Yamagishi. So yes, I am definitely have upped my, like if money muscles and game, I upped the muscles part this, this year. And I'm glad to say I did. And man, let me tell you something. I caught so much shit in September. 
because I went to, I did the finals for the wet Republic bikini contest. And it wasn't my, my wife was totally cool with it. It was the other guys when I was putting out pictures on like YouTube. And I only put like three pictures out of me at that contest. And there's some other ones out there that, that Mike put out. And I think Corey, his photographer, videographer had put out as well. And I'm like, I was, I was proud, man. I was like, fuck, I'm 55 years old. And this is how I look at 55 years old. And I look better than like kids and fucking, you know, thir- in their thirties. Right. And I, I mean, I feel pretty confident in saying like, I look better than a lot of guys at 50, much less 55, but boy, let me tell you something. They will not let you own that. No one will let you own that. So own your successes for sure. And then also give yourself credit occasionally, you know, because nobody else is going to give it to you. It's only important to you. <laughs> People ask me stuff like, Hey, is this really important? Or only to me. <laughs> You know, bear that in mind. Happy New Year. Thank you. Uh, big thanks for all you do. Thank you, Chalk T. Love you like a brother. No homo. Happy New Year, Professor. Can you take me out with I'm a whore? Oh, well, of course I can't take you out. Well, I'm a whore. Yeah. Oh. Take me out old school. Shotgun. Boom. Uh, Happy New Year from South Africa. Fucking AC. The red pill is international. Thank you for all your time and work and uh, knowledge. Peace be with you, my friend. Maybe I'm a Spurg, but shouldn't characters need struggles to overcome? Yes, they should. How they overcome them is different. I'm trying to blend judo, Christian, and stoic values in the dark fantasy setting. What am I missing that you are saying? Okay, so here's the thing about stoicism. Would you like me to give you a breakdown on stoicism? Because I can do that. Hold on, let me go down and catch up with the, the chat here. Try to see what everybody's been saying. I've been I've been ignoring the chat. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, didn't use one. Thank you. <laughs> no, actually, I you know, as odd as it sounds, I actually am ethical. <laughs> I'm not about plagiarism. I don't want anybody to write for me. I don't people put people put words in my mouth as it is. You think I want somebody else? I'm going to pay somebody to do it. No. Um, so uh, Judeo Christianity uh, and uh, stoic values. Okay. Well, so is that the character? That doesn't sound very dark fantasy to me, but maybe it is. Um, so what I'm saying is it's not necessarily conflict. Obviously, no story exists without conflict. In fact, that's the basis of any like really good plot, any good storytelling. There has to be something like that. You, I mean, you probably already know the hero's journey. Got it. What I'm saying is that the character itself, those characters, you can make them stoic if you'd like. You can make them that way. If that's, if that's the, the direction you want to go with it, I got it. But as far as stoicism is concerned, I think a lot of people really kind of, I don't know. I think stoicism gets a bad rap right now because I think one of the reasons, and I read this, uh, I should go dig this up, but uh, Rob Henderson uh, put a, I want to say if it was a Substack post or if it was something I read on Twitter, he's talking about this research on stoicism and the rise in popularity of stoicism, particularly in the manosphere right now. I am seeing, by the way, dozens of these, like these AI channel, but I can only call them AI channels. Because what they are is they're scripts that are, there's a process to this. Maybe you've seen these, maybe you haven't. I don't know how, how involved you guys really are in this kind of shit. But I look at this stuff because I'm looking at what my next comp, my next competitors are going to be or who's going to be like using my material and like reprocessing it. That's why when I put that one dude up there is basically using like my vernacular and his shit. Um, you know, I, I pick that out and I think a lot of other people kind of pick it out too. But I'm looking at these these channels and a lot of them like are stoicism channels and what they are is they are you can the process is I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here the process is this they will get guy they will go to somebody's like blog who writes about stoicism or something and they will say okay chat gpt rewrite this article for me boom and they rewrite it it's, it would pass all the plagiarism tests but it's basically the same article just in different vernacular different different in, in ai speak right and in some cases, it might be good. You might edit it a little bit, but that's about it. So you've, now you've got a script. Then you go get an AI voice actor, which, by the way, I know that YouTube Google is starting to ban off of uh, off of YouTube. But 
it's going to get to the point where even the algorithm won't be able to keep up with the different variations. But right now they're trying to ban sort of like cyber, like AI robotic readers, but they sound pretty legit. And you can get like different voice intonation. So it sounds like Marcus Aurelius reading about stoicism. The script on stoicism that you just lifted from somebody else's site. Now you've got the script. Now you've got the voice actor that is AI as well. And then you can actually go and have that have AI through either Dolly or maybe mid journey, or I forget what, what the other ones are. You can generate just, you know, pictures that are like these stone men who are like, look like Zeus and, and, you know, look like Roman gods of some sorts. And they're walking away from women because they, I've got no time for this earthly wench. I've got big things to do on Mount Olympus. You know, I'm stoic. I not, I don't need to tap any ass. So I'm going up the, up the hill right now. Goodbye, bitch. And so there's the, you know, now you've got the, now you've got the thumbnail. Now you've got all this series of, of photos and now it's just ba- all this. And then you've got, of course, it's going to read it to you. Of course, it's got, you got to have a closed captioning on it. So it's got that going on there. And it's basically reading it for you. you did, you've done nothing except for like source the pictures and maybe like adjust the script a little bit. And then you make a, about a eight to 12 minute video on stoicism and it, people eat it up at least from the engagement that I'm seeing right now. And there's dozens of these channels right now. The guys who are behind them are probably, it's probably one or two, maybe three different guys, but they run just dozens of these channels. And one's a stoicism one, one might be a red pill one, whatever it is, but they're basically like, they're like um, personality less uh, podcasts or sites or videos. There's no talking head. It's just all it is is narration. And some, you know, some visual interest in the pictures that are, are running by. Some of them might be animated. Who knows? But that's cheesy, man. Like, to me, when I look at that, I'm like, who the fuck is listening? But a lot of people get off on this. And they, why, so why are they getting off on stoicism? Well, the reason is, is like stoicism is, it's easy. It's low-hanging fruit is what it is. They say, well, well, what about emotional control, Rolo? You should be in control of your emotions. Well, yeah, okay. You shouldn't have to read Marcus Aurelius to be in control of your emotions, okay? And I think that one of the reasons why Stoicism seems really appealing to, um, really well, trad concept for sure, but like uh, MGTOW, uh, sort of like the loner personnel, a Sigma male. I'm a Sigma male. I'm going to go Stoic, right? Well, that's very appealing because it's easy. It's like, it's a rationale that's easy. I don't do those things. I would never, I have more respect for myself than that. I'm going, it's easy not to do something. It's hard to do something. It's like, there's a, was it proving the negative? Like you're, you're proving the negative. It's if the negative is, I don't do that. (laughs) What's your, what's your investment cost then? Nothing. (laughs) Good. You're a mighty man of the Mount Olympus. Stoicism it's maybe now I, I I'm maybe I'm just jaded because of the, the way that sort of online social media culture is right now. But uh, there's been research that's done on stoicism and the rise in popularity of stoicism during certain eras of like of the 20th century and into the 21st century. And why is it now suddenly um, uh, popularized? Well, because there's a lot of shit that's like really depressing right now. And uh, I was reading, I forget who it was on Substack. It was well, the title of the article was why, why are there so many sad songs now? Why, why is music so depressing right now? Why does it seem like to like the, was it hard times create strong men, strong men, create good times, good times, create weak men, weak men, create hard times. We're in the weak men create hard times. Like that cyclic thing that everybody wants to tell you is a cycle. And that's why everything's depressing. There's degenerates. There's, you know, there's so in, in that condition, in the, in the, the social conditions that we find ourselves in right now, stoicism seems very popular because you, you just basically, you don't do it's, it's no, no investment cause. I don't, I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to touch myself. I'm going to be stoic. Well, you still have to do something at some point. I don't think enough people who think, I don't think stoicism is really what a lot of people think stoicism really is. Like it tell you, you want to learn about the stoics. You got to go and read a lot more than Marcus Aurelius. There's other stoics, by the way, (laughs) uh, Rollo enjoy the brown butter for uh, the coming year. Brown butter, uh, stacks, MREs. Oh, uh, stack MREs meals ready to eat. 
Uh, five fifty six. Yeah, uh, twenty twenty four is going to be wild. Uh, yeah, yeah. Remember, man. Remember. Oh shit. You might be right. <laughs> I remember in uh, it was in twenty twenty. Of course, when everybody was losing their shit. Now five fifty six. Yeah, I could. I could use that. <laughs> I could use that ammo. Um, you know, are you a prepper? I'm not a prepper. I have a my. I guess my. My Tacoma, I have, a, I have a Toyota Tacoma. I have a 2015 Toyota Tacoma. It's a, it's a crew cab. Uh, I have a, a I know many people have seen it, but it's got, uh, it's got the shell on it. Mostly for my dogs. Right. But uh, if there's, if it's, it's a semi like halfway to a bug out truck right now, which are, is very popular in rural parts of Nevada, by the way. <laughs> and more so where I moved to recently, but uh yeah, I, I can remember back in 2020 when uh, when everybody's making runs on Walmart for toilet paper. Or, um, by the way, you know, it's interesting to me is like when I think about Ned, this is really weird. But when I think about Ned, I actually adopted Ned the day the lockdowns went into effect. I was I had to drive down to like the middle of California because I had to meet up with the the agency that we adopted him from, and. That was the day you were not supposed to be like in public places anymore. You were supposed to wear a, a mask. Well, was, yeah, a mask was mandated back then. Um, but you were supposed to like be, you know, shelter in place kind of thing. And here we are just driving. We're driving down 395, going down to Big Pine to go pick up Ned. And I have pictures of it too. And nobody really thought anything of it. But it was like March 25th of 2020 is when I got Ned. And He's my COVID purchase. I, that was the last big thing I did before everything went to hell. And, uh, and I'm glad I did. He was my COVID buy. <laughs> Ned was my COVID buy. But um, yeah, I, I remember looking at like my, my father-in-law is a gun. I've never really been a gun guy per se, but my, my father-in-law from Texas most definitely is my wife's father. You know, alpha male, he's got it. Um, but uh he was the one that got me into shooting and to like uh, going to the range and stuff like that. And it really was good between the two of us because it was something we both mutually had a hobby. Well, I turned it into a hobby for me. I just did it because I wanted to hang out with them. And that, then I got, I'm like, Oh, now I realize well, how fun this is. So then of course me being a collector and having the collector mentality you now. Yeah. I don't have any guns though. They all, they were all lost in a tragic boating accident. They all went to the bottom of the lake. I've done no guns here whatsoever. Um, but, uh, I remember when ammo was scarce we would go like he and I would go to shields whenever they got a new shipment in and five fifty six was gone. Nine millimeter was gone. Three eighty was gone, but you know, what was there 22 long rifle that you could get a 22 anytime you want. <laughs> 10 millimeter. I'm like, man, I need a 10 millimeter gun. I don't know I have, who owns 10 millimeter gun, right? There's tons of it. It's not a popular caliber that's why it's like i need to get a gun that has a popular as, as an unpopular caliber i thought that would be wise <laughs> maybe i should get a 10 millimeter before everything goes to hell 10 millimeter ammo tons nine millimeter gone <laughs> happy new year rollo your work has been great and helped me ask the right questions thank you Thank you for saying that too, by the way, the right questions, because sometimes they're the wrong questions. Jackie Chun. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Jackie Chun. Uh, one thing I found funny about Star Wars Legends is the unrealistic portrayal of our relationships. E.G., a blonde girl likes Han Solo and then stops pursuing him when she sees him with Leia, a princess. Your thoughts on this? Well, let me tell you, Jackie Chun. Um, I can't really give you an objective opinion on that because Han Solo was the character of Han Solo was written back in the 70s. We didn't have the sensibilities for that character right now. You would never. That's why I keep telling guys, like, if you're going to write red pill fiction, write Captain Kirk, write Han Solo and like have them be unapologetically masculine. Don't let it like no compromise. There is no John Wayne anymore. There's no well, old school. There's no old, even Clint Eastwood. There's no Clint Eastwoods anymore. 
There's no outlaw Josie Wales. There's no dirty Harry. And people say, well, those action heroes like like uh, Sylvester Stallone and and uh, 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger, those guys are examples of toxic masculinity. Oh. I wouldn't. I don't think they are, but I wouldn't even use them as an example. There's other better examples, I think. Um, they're almost over the. They're almost characters of them, caricatures of themselves. The Rock is a caricature of himself right now. But if you have like Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones don't, he don't care about nothing. You just get the job done. And by the way, I would also say that, you know, I was giving you some, some advice as far as being a, me giving you advice. I'm giving you advice about like you know, writing a red pill novel or whatever it is. Don't develop care. Don't feel like you have to explain every fucking detail. Oh, he's like this because he had a bad childhood. No, you don't have to give away a character's background. You don't have to write some big detailed outline, you know, character outline for them. They just are who they are. Just do that. I was, um, I was reading well, one of my favorite people are going to really okay, come to nerd out on you for really quick. This is the, this is the new year's Eve show, right? I'm going to nerd out on you here really quickly. Um, one of my favorite comic book artists is a man named Michael golden. He's really, I mean, he's not golden era, but he's like silver era, maybe copper era, 70s, like mid 70s ish. One of like absolutely fantastic artists in comic book style. Love Michael Golden. I've met him on like three different occasions. Really cool dude. I'm happy to say I've like, I even have like a, I've got some, uh, his covers like signed. I have some of my, I won't tell you which, which ones, but I have some comic books that have been signed by Michael Golden that are like my prize possessions. And I really like, he's just as an individual, Mike is a great dude. I haven't talked to him or seen him in quite some time, but I remember the first time I met him in uh, Orlando because he was at uh, one of the comic book stores that I would frequent and um, got him to sign some stuff. And you know, he's a good dude. And I talked to him and we were just sort of getting in a conversation. One of the things he was saying was like, he's like, it's like, I just, we were talking about like modern comics versus like what it was like when he was in the biz. And he's still in the biz right now, but like, not like he was working for Marvel. Um, but he, um, he was saying, you know, cause he would write stories and stuff for a lot of his characters, like that he would develop would end up being the, the inspiration for the actual plot of the story that was going on in the book. Right. And he was saying, you know, the difference between modern comics and old school, like silver era, golden era is like a bad guy and a good guy can't just be bad guys and good guys. They can't just be that part. You always have to explain everything about them. Like the Joker who had a shit childhood and that's why he is who he is. And we have to have some sort of sympathy and blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, why can't a bad guy just be a fucking bad guy and stick to the plot? Have something that's going on in the plot. Oh, Batman had his parents got killed and blah, 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 blah. Okay. Interesting. Good. It rounds that person out. But that character that Bruce Wayne, the young Bruce Wayne, who becomes Batman, that Batman wasn't fleshed out as Bruce Wayne, the poor child whose parents were orphaned, blah, 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 blah. He was just fucking Batman and Batman and Robin. He was the Dark Knight. And, you know, they fleshed it out later on. And then later on, we add layers and layers and layers. But the original characters, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, like the name of Captain America, right? Name it. It was about the plot. And the characters were there to sort of drive the plot, to move the plot along. And he was saying like um, that, uh, you know, what, I don't know if it's even possible to do this anymore because there's almost this expectation to have the, these real soul searching. Yeah. There's no good guys and bad guys because the good guys are good guys who are really actually anti-heroes or they're really turned into the bad guys because they're only good guys because they feel like they got to crush the bad guys because of their shit childhood or their dad was overbearing or whatever it was. And then the bad guys are bad because they come up from a very bad circumstances and their mom beat them or something like that. Or they had, you know, a drug addicted, you know, stepfather or some shit like that. And so now the good guy is actually the bad guy and the bad guy is actually the good guy. He's like, why can't you just not have yeah, you know, and drive the plot along instead of having the story be about the characters and have it more be about the plot. And I think, and I, I was talking to the guys in a, uh, 
uh, Red Pill Lions, those uh, Kevin and, and Rocky and them, because they're amateur, I say amateur, semi amateur, <laughs> semi pro uh, film producers, filmmakers. And we had this conversation. It was, you know, we, we like to put things in terms of like superheroes. You don't have to do that. It can be just regular characters too. But it's always, it's always about the fucking character and not about the plot because nobody knows how to do, how write a real interesting, like engaging story anymore because we write serials. We write, it's, it's churn marketing. We don't write a movie and have and be done with it. We have to have series. We don't write those. We don't have a self-contained story anymore and go, okay, it's done. Hey, we're going to do a sequel. Nope. Prequel. Nope. Just as done. That's it. Thank you. Give me my money. Go home. Write story. Cash check. That doesn't happen anymore because we're so we're, we're embedded in this Netflix serialization. What's the next series? I know I'm, I love watching series, man. I was pissed off when Ozark was done. I was pissed off when like, you know, Breaking Bad. I'm like, come on, man. This, you got one more season left and you want to see what happens to the rest of these guys. And yes, I did see the movie with uh, Jesse Pinkman, the, the actually standalone movie. So you can find out what happened to him too. Right. But we, we, our, our, our storytelling is really based now anyways, on this serial series. It's like, how is Superman going to get out of this situation? Find out next month in next issue of Superman Action Comics. How is Walter White ever going to get out of this situation? You know, he's <laughs> he's doomed. Well, you're going to have to wait till next season to find out. Ozark. Fuck, man, that was a really great series, too. I'm not saying it wasn't interesting, but it's driven by character rather than plot. And in fact, it has to be because it's so fucking long. So it's not just about the plots that are happening during that, whatever that season is. It's mostly about character development. You can't even appreciate what's going on in the plot. If you're in season four and you don't know all the plot development or all this character development that happened like season one, two, and three. So. Uh, let's see what you got uh, for the writing. It's like Sam and Frodo's brotherhood overcoming great evil of the loss of one's entire family and kind of like man's search for meaning. Okay. So, Okay, I get it, but don't like like I would say focus primarily on plot. You don't have to eat like writing. I don't know. I know this is just me. Okay, but I don't think art should be catharsis. I know it is for a lot of people. Uh, if you go and you look at who was it? Oh, I know. Um, it was a uh, Stephen King. Stephen King damn near writes himself as a character even if it's just a side character into damn near every every uh, uh story he has ever produced maybe not the shining although <laughs> uh if you if you uh if you read the stand by stephen king he's harold in that i mean literally down to the he's you know submitting his stories and getting rejected by publishing houses like literally happening in that story. and it was a good story too but um he writes himself into it because it's a catharsis for the author. You'll never get that from me. I who is not. I want the stories that I have written thus far, and I haven't published anything yet, just yet, but the stories that I've written thus far are plot driven. They're not character driven. Although the care, I mean, it's not to say character development isn't important, but the plot should be, I think is the, is a much more important aspect of fiction anyways. And the reason for that is because it's a, if you want to write red pill fiction, it needs to really be about something that's engaging. But as a result of that plot, you're learning something sort of like red pill about about human nature. People like storytelling because they want to hear something or they want to see something in that character that they can relate with. And if you throw them off with uh, this, this guy is actually a red pill guy. You don't call him that. And the I would never like describe them as oh you know so and so is red pill, but uh, it's it's a it's it's the difference between like the plot driving the message as opposed to the character driving the message if if that makes sense. Uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis age seven, severe depression age ten, idiopathic hypersomnia. Jesus man, I want to fuck. I need a dictionary. Maybe I got a thesaurus. Uh, hypersomnia does that mean sleep you sleep a lot hypersomnia because i know somnia is sleep why does michaela peterson have a three times one disposition for being 
graped as a child with these immune system problems. Three to one disposition? I'm not really sure what three to one means. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Yeah, she did say that, didn't she? Severe depression. I have depression too. I could go make up. I could tell you I had some depression at age 10. You probably believe me too, but I didn't. <laughs> 10 idiopathic. Uh, that was at age 10. Idiopathic hypersomnia. So, Sam, do me a favor. Look up idiopathic somnia, in, hypersomnia, just so I have a clear definition of that. Why does Michaela Peterson have? Okay, well, Michaela Peterson's whack. That's first of all. Honestly, I wouldn't even look at all of those things. There's only one real diagnosis for, for Michaela Peterson. Go look up videos on uh, functional autism because she meets all the criteria for functional autism. I also want to know why does do it. Do you guys even know this? Did you know she has a brother? Did you know that they're like, like Tammy and Jordan have a son? Why don't we ever hear about the brother? How come he's not in the family pictures? I didn't even see him in the wedding photos. Maybe I did, but I just didn't know he was there. Like why? I know more about like uh, Jordan Fuller. I know more about uh, uh, Andre, the the previous. I know more about the, than I do the brother. Like why? What's, what's up with that? He's never in any shots. He's never in any photos. I know he wasn't a musician at some point. He's supposed to be a musician at some point, but they never. I, even, I couldn't even tell you his name, but I know they. Yet she has a brother. Okay, idiopathic hypersomnia, IH, of course, it's an acronym, is a sleep disorder. Sorry, let me pull this out. Is a sleep disorder in which a person is excessively sleepy. I have hypersomnia. During the day and has great difficulty being awakened from sleep. <laughs> My wife would probably agree with that. Uh, I, idiopathic means there is not a clear cause. <laughs> Um, you stayed up too late. Maybe you had too much coffee. Uh, sleep patterns change with age, anxiety levels, and many other factors. Thank you for that. Idiopathic. <laughs> Shit, that sounds like half the people I know. Happy New Year, Rolo. Can we get an in-depth or not on not qualifying women? And by this, do you mean not qualify women? off rip oh qualify to them okay uh or not qualify ever no well okay first of all it's impossible not to qualify for women period this is uh i, I did a full show on this dancing monkeys um they're i don't know if it's so popular now i mean maybe maybe it still is but uh there's the dancing monkey phenomenon triple monkey backflips <laughs> triple monkey backflips uh, the dancing monkey uh, theory phenomenon is that the you only do anything to just sort of impress me. I had Maya Allegra on or on rule zero. And so people will say, oh, you're simping. Oh, simping basically is a dancing monkey, right? You'll do anything for pussy. pussy. That's the dancing monkey syndrome. Okay. So but dancing monkey simping is relies on one thing. Qualification. Because everything you do is qualifying for women. So you can take that to the, the most ridiculous, absurd, like extremes possible. So let's just say, for example, and I have heard these examples before. You're only going to the gym because you want to look better for women. You're simping. You're qualifying. And <laughs> you're only you only got that. Um, you only got that. Uh, that promotion, you you only try to get that into that line of work because you want pussy. Rolo, you're only a musician because you wanted to get tail. And <laughs> it's like it comes back to a, a, a post that I wrote. Uh, this is also in my second book, but it's called the crisis of um, crisis of identity. Yeah, crisis of identity, uh, crisis. Um, forget the name. I'm, 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 I'm drawing a blank. Anyways, what it is, is why do you do what you do? Uh, why do you work out? Why do you dress the way you do? Why do you uh, eat the way you do? Why do you think the way you do? Why do you dress the way you do? And women will say it's easy. To, it's easy to poke fun at women because I, I used an example one time, like where women I was I was talking to one of my poor girls when I was in the liquor industry and she was talking about how, oh, I dress this way for me. And that sort of spawned this 
the crisis, a crisis of motive, uh, cri like the, her crisis of motive. And I said, well, so you do, you dress in like semi lingerie just for yourself, right? Yes. I just do it for me. I'm not trying to get guys to look at me. I'm not doing it for other women. I'm just doing it for me. I'm like, yeah, sorry. Crisis of motive. Hey, put that in the chat. Will you, uh, Sam, um, I do this for me. Uh, and so I said that I, I, I dropped it and I said, so if I went to your house at four o'clock in the afternoon, I would find you in lingerie <laughs> vacuuming your floor or washing the dishes because you just dress that way for you. Well, no, I would be in sweats. I like, so you're everybody does. It. And there's no shame in that, by the way, like, why not? Who cares? You're qualifying no matter what. So whether you're doing it consciously or you're doing it unconsciously, the people like to say, I'm not very creative. I'm not an artist. If you dressed yourself this fucking morning, you're an artist. If you figured something out, there's reasons why you dress the way you do. There's reasons why you put the makeup on like you do. You wear your hair. You wear it long, right? Bro's got a greasy ponytail. He's trying to be something he's not. Dude, do you know how long I've had long hair? <laughs> I'm pretty much all through my 20s. I only cut my hair between like 30 and 45 ish. I started growing it out in 2017 again. And it was really because I, I wasn't even in a band at the time. I was, I got in a band later. I was trial of sentient, but um, my mom, I knew she wasn't going to be around much longer. And she said, I really love to see your hair long again. So I started growing it out really for my mother <laughs> qualifying, <laughs> But uh, why do you wear it long? Why do you look the way you do? Why do you take TRT? Why do you go to the gym? Why do you say the things you do? Why do you, why do you show up? You're already showing off. You're not really like that. People just want to disqualify you, right? Disqualify you. Everything's qualification when you think about it. When people say, I don't care what other people think about me, they're full of shit. Some, on some level of consciousness, you care about what other people think about you. You do. I don't care. Yeah, I'm a Sigma. You're not no fucking Sigma. The very fact that you would call yourself a Sigma disqualifies you, qualify, from being a Sigma. Because Sigmas don't go, I'm a Sigma. They don't, that doesn't occur. They're just like a Zen state. I don't, there's really no such thing as a Sigma to begin with. It's just an antisocial alpha is what a, a Sigma is. There's pro-social alphas and there's anti-social alphas. The sigmas, like people glommed onto sigma because they want to think that they're outside. I'm a rebel. I'm outside of this framework. I'm, I'm above. I'm stoic. I'm above all of this. No, you're not. The very fact that you're broadcasting in the first place is qualifying to somebody. So, no, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with there's, there's If it's an unequal exchange of value, that's simping. You're still qualifying, but that's simping. So, it's not that you're never going to, that you never qualify or you shouldn't qualify. Women should qualify to you. Hopefully that's because that's the dynamic that you really want. And that's kind of like what you're getting at, uh, like in this, in your question here, it's like not qualifying the women. It's not that you don't qualify to women. You're the very fact that you're having the conversation with that person in the first place means you're, there's a certain exchange of like, she's evaluating your value in having the conversation or being attracted to you in the first place. But the key is, getting that woman to qualify to you. Most guys, that's a foreign, they think that that's playing games. They think that that's manipulation. When a woman is just can't take her eyes off of you, her eyes are dilated and she just like hangs on your every word. And she's like, you know, she's the hell yes girl. That girl, she will qualifying to you as a guy. She's going to start getting into Swedish death metal. She's going to be a Raiders, Las Vegas Raiders fan, maybe Golden Knights fan. But she's always been an Avalanche fan. No, not anymore. She's always been a, a Dallas Cowboys fan. No, she loves Jimmy Garoppolo now. <laughs> no, nobody likes Jimmy Garoppolo. <laughs> uh, but she's a, she's a Raiders fan now. Like that, that's qualifying. It's finding things to be, to have some sort of compatibility with. That's qualifying. That's an extreme example of that. It's not so much like you're not qualifying. Well, you're going to do it no matter what. But the, the, the balance of that, it's like, um, was it Royce or yeah, Royce used to say it's the two thirds rule for every, for every two things you do, she gives you three. So there's always sort of like a slight imbalance where she's always coming. She's always coming up to you, qualifying to you. Is this good enough? Am I good enough? Um, are, you know, it's just even just having that passive third party dread 
that sense of urgency that because that's really the value differential. It's like I want to be with this guy because there's no doubt in my mind that this guy is a high value guy. Well, what do women do when they have a high value guy? They've got to qualify to that guy, at least in the back of their head to some degree. I'm not saying to unhealthy degrees where she's just obsessing over it. Oh, he's going to cheat on me. That's not what I mean. Saying she understands and appreciates your value. And therefore, as a result of that appreciation, she wants to qualify to you. Maybe that's sucking your dick. Maybe that's being a fan of Jimmy Garoppolo. <laughs> Maybe that's, a you know, starting to like find out what you really like. What does he like to eat? What does he like to do? What does he think about this? Da, 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 da. A, an interest. That's qualification. And then, of course, what happens as a result of that qualification is she enters into your frame, into your world. That is a much more long-winded answer than I intended. Uh, why did Google wipe the search results after your stream on her? On Michaela? I posted my, a master's thesis with citations a few months ago. You did a master's thesis on that? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, maybe she did it herself. I think, I think that I'll, with, uh, with her association with Tate, she doesn't want to have the association with me because I was the only one who had the balls to go and ask her point blank about that stuff. I'm the only one that said, where were you on the night of the, you know, why did you go to Romania? Why did you have a costume change when you were there? Why did you have lipstick on when you arrived and no lipstick on when you left? There's two. And by the way, I can prove that to you in two set with two pictures. I can prove that. I can prove that to you. Did you go axe throwing? Because I have one of those. I have the shot with her at with with Tate at the, the, the Tate compound. He's got this little mini axe in his hand. What was that all about? Did you go axe throwing? Because that's really what they're for, I think. Um, maybe not. What was that all about? I was the only one that asked her point blank about that. And I know that that's going to be something that's going to sort of, it's not even so much about her. It's going to be more about, uh, uh, Jordan Peterson because Peterson has been talking shit about Tate a lot recently. And what's ironic is there's a, there's a, maybe he realizes this and maybe he doesn't, but there's enough people that still remember that. 2018 2019 maybe he doesn't because he was in some rehab in russia getting off of benzodiazepine but yeah maybe that's all a blur but you know jordan isn't the same jordan that he used to be i don't know why they would wipe that i would say if there is a, if it has been wiped i would say it's probably at the behest of daily wire who jordan works for he has a licensure with them i don't know I am overjoyed that she has a kid overjoyed. I hope she has two more after this because that will take her out of the game permanently. Uh, as a fellow writer, the shift from plot to character is feminization of storytelling. It is because why? Because women are interested in people and men are interested in things. You want to write a really good story for guys, by guys, for guys, be interested in things, be interested in the plot. Women love character development because that's what gets them off people. Yeah. Boys play with action figures and pretend to be Batman. Girls play with dolls and pretend to be Barbie. Pretend that Barbie joins them. <laughs> it's things and people. Thanks for the advice. Any Michael Golden work. Thanks for the advice. Any Michael Golden works. Uh, Jesus Christ. You're going to really put me on the spot here. Just look up Michael Golden. And uh, his his real his best work, I Robert Coslin is going to just jump all up my ass for this. But uh, the Micronauts was a really good one for uh, Marvel. It's the best one. I think he's got some other ones. Uh, he, has a, he had a series called The Nam, which was stories about Vietnam. Uh, and uh, he illustrated a good portion of that. I don't know how much writing he did on that, too, because sometimes like artists will be involved in the writing as well. He had one called The Nam. I'm trying to think he's all, I mean, he's done like dr strange he's done like regular like superheroes as well too i'm trying to think of the books that he was like really sort of instrumental in and i, I can say the nam and micronauts and i'm trying to think who else just I, you guys i could tell you all kinds of really the names of really good comic book artists from like the late 70s and there into the mid 80s butch guys great arthur adams mcfarlane yeah Uh, I've written some scenes down. I'm wondering when is a good time to publish and hire an editor when you're done. <laughs> Do you have any ideas? Yes. When you're done. 
Only you get to tell, only you get to say when you're done. And then by the way, when you hire, like you're going to publish self, you're going to self publish anyways. Don't even bother going to a, to a, a traditional publishing house. Um, but when you're hiring an editor, especially for fiction, you want to, there's two ways to do editing. One is to have, I, I don't really use content editing. Um, when I use an editor and by the way, I have for like the last three books, not the first two. Um, when I work with an editor, you can either get somebody who's going to help you. It like depends on the, their level of editing. Uh, it can be for grammar, syntax, um, you know, catching your typos, that kind of stuff. That That's like the minimum level of editing. Then there is content editing. Like you could have written this different. Use active voice and passive voice. Don't use Grammarly, please. It's it, Grammarly is the, the AI Gestapo of writing. Get a real human to do it for you, especially for fiction. Um, but uh, yeah, and I, in your case, I think maybe you probably want to go with content somebody who's going to help you sort of like, uh, well, you could, it's not necessarily like you're going to change your story. It's just going to help you like write it. So it's more digestible, I guess, if you have a really good editor anyway, what you got. Oh, what's this? Wait, 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 wait. Hey, Rollo. Thanks for all of the advice that you have provided when considering all of the facts. When do you think we will have a societal collapse? Because of the ever so increasing divide between men and women. Well, let's see if I can remember this. People look to me and say, is the end near? When is the final day? What's the future of mankind? How would I know I got left behind? <laughs> well, song. Somebody knows that song. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Don't ask me. I don't know. Um, anyways, uh, societal collapse. I don't think you're going to see a societal collapse because of that. Uh, simply because a lot of the divide, if, if there is even such a thing, a divide between men and women right now, I think it's really a divide. I think it's, it's more lopsided towards women than it is towards men right now. Men are just disincentivized. Women are the ones who are like, remember, because women do women. So men perform women select. Okay. And, when women are selecting and they're like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to get with this guy. He's not good enough. I'm not going to settle for that. It's you go girl. Only the best for you. It's this, what Rich Cooper was saying. It's like, you know, we tell guys to do the right thing and we tell women do the right thing for you, girl. Like, you know, do what's good for you. Live your truth, girl. Speak your truth, girl. Truth is objective. It's all about you. And isn't that interesting because of what I was just saying about solipsism not too long ago. You do you. Yeah, everything is you, 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 you. <laughs> when uh, when we were, let's see, when I was in So Suave back in the day, one of the things we would do is if we were ever like commenting on an article or if we were tearing apart an article, it's much easier to do them because it was all written word, right? We would count how many instances women would use the word, <laughs> word, the letter, I, capital I, 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 me, 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 I think as a woman, blah, blah, blah. Every, if you go and you look at female writing versus male writing, women are very facile, F-A-C-I-L-E, uh, using inferences of I and me and, and, well, I mean, making things personalized more. And whenever women want to give you sort of a confounding argument for something you say, especially in the red pill space, it always starts with, as a woman, ladies, if you start your sentence with, as a woman, I tune you out immediately because you're not being objective. You're being subjective, yourself being a subject, right? As a woman, well, let me say from the, from the jump here, that's A, that's solipsism. B, the fact that your default is to presume to speak for womankind because your personal experience should define the universal whole of women, womanhood. I can't think of a better way of illustrating female solipsism <laughs> than that. As a woman, mm, stop right there. Talk to the hand. Stop right there. If you want to make a good fact, if you want to talk, you want to present something, don't presume to speak for all of womankind. I catch guys doing that sometimes. As a man, nobody cares. You know why guys don't default to that? Because nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that you're a man. As a man, let me tell you. 
I would, I would never presume to speak for all of mankind. Why would I do that? Rolo, how come the red pill isn't like one size fits all? Because I would be insulting your intelligence as a 55 year old white guy born and raised in Pasadena, California, some Huntington beach who was trying to tell you how to, how things ought to be in, I don't know, Mumbai or Tokyo or Kenya or Nairobi, right? I would be, I would be stupid to presume that my personal experience should define the whole, but that's exactly what women do. Just like off the cuff, man. So you have to be careful of that shit. Uh, so it's the personalization effect. What's this? Uh, Travis, Sharp, did I get you uh, provide uh, facts? When do you think a societal collapse? <sighs> There's not going to be societal collapse. Things are going to change. I think a lot of people, th I think a lot of people are wishing and hoping for societal collapse. Be careful what you wish for. It's like, enjoy the decline. The problem with enjoy the decline is eventually you're going to get to the bottom of the decline and you're fucked. Well, I enjoyed my time. I guess I'm dead. I, I've never been on board with enjoy the decline. Uh, I understand the mentality of it. And sometimes it seems like the easiest, most, it almost seems like the most responsible way to deal with certain things. I know like Aaron Clary talks about, like, I think he's the one that coined that, right? Enjoy the decline. Does he have a, I think he has a book or in in one of his books, he says, enjoy the decline. Okay. But eventually you get to the bottom of the decline. If you live like there's no tomorrow, then tomorrow becomes your worst enemy. Tomorrow becomes what you fear because you're like, oh, well, I was supposed to be dead by now. There's supposed to be collapsed by now. The meteor was supposed to hit earth by now. I guess it's not going to happen. I guess the rapture hasn't happened yet. I better figure something out. Oh, what well, you mean? I've been like living like there's no tomorrow. Now it's tomorrow here at the bottom of the decline. What are you going to do? Yeah, nothing apparently because you haven't done jack shit to prepare for anything. I don't see. I'm a pragmatist. I'm not an optimist and I'm not a pessimist or a cynic. I'm a pragmatist. And really that's what praxeology ought to be about. I know I use the word ought just right now, but praxeology is what it is. But if you're going to create predictive frameworks, if you're going to make that praxeology of the red pill useful, I think it needs to be based on just cold, harsh, pragmatism here's best practices knowing what we know right now what our best practice let's make this useful knowing what we know right now how do we put this into effect how do i use the red pill to make a better life sometimes just the knowledge is enough you don't have to ask me for permission to like you know move from austin texas to brickle <laughs> you already know what you're gonna do you just want permission now rorella said it was cool it could have been Tate, could have been anybody. Superman could have told you the same thing. You just want permission to do what you want to do anyways. Well, just go fucking do it. <laughs> well, see what happens. Tell me, come back to me and tell me how it worked out for you. But it's pragmatism. Expect the best, but prepare for the worst. Like build yourself up. Become a, oh, become a high value man. Become a high value man, not for chicks, not because Ben Shapiro or Matt Walsh or anybody at Turning Point USA said, we need to have more babies. They don't care about you. They want you to be the best you can be because these ladies need a fucking guy to like knock them up and go into perpetuity with them. That's fucked up. You know why? Because you're making your mental point of origin, not yourself. You're making some future chick that you have, don't even know her name. And you're trying to qualify yourself to this guy at Turning Point USA or Ben Shapiro or Matt Walsh or Candace Owens or whoever whatever moralistic finger wagger you think is worth listening to. No, do it because you want to be better. It's for you. Fuck those guys. <laughs> stoicism. You want real stoicism? Mental point of origin. Oh, I need to be a servant leader. You're never going to be a leader of jack shit until you can get to the point where you're selfish enough to say, I know that the things that work for me will help other people as well. I can tell you with 100% certainty right now that the decisions that I make by and large, 97% of the decisions that I make right now are going to benefit my wife, my kid, my, my, my son-in-law, my mother-in-law. 
<laughs> Sam Bata. <laughs> he, he knows what I'm talking about. You know, Mike Sartain. I think of people who are sick, all the people who are associated with me. And I have to have the fucking ball sack to say, you know what? I'm confident enough in the decisions that I make that I know what's best for me. And guess what? If it's best for me, then the people that I care about and the people who are my best friends and the people I love and my Ned benefits because of the decisions that I made, because I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to do that. And I don't think I'm going to do this. Pragmatism. Don't wait for a decline. Prepare for the worst. Expect the best. Be optimistic enough to, you know, say, hey, look, things worked out. Awesome. Appreciate that they did. If they don't, at least, at least you're somewhat prepared. Remember I told you I had like my Tacoma is my, my, my bug out truck. It's not really a bug out truck. It kind of looks like one. It's nice to have. Like, There's certain things. I got a first aid kit in it. I got like, you know, sidebars and got the lights and everything like that. And, you know, look, looked apart. But, you know, it's nice to have. It's nice to know. Got big old tank tires on it too if i need to i could carry my my snowmobiles up the hill have fun on that stuff it's not i'm not like i'm not a doomsday prepper but it's nice to know that i have that stuff it's pragmatic i got a strike for commenting on your video in regards to michaela a strike how do you get a strike for a comment i don't know how you get a strike for a comment i'm sorry that you did uh or was it something you did in a video Thank you. So don't use Fiverr to find an editor. Yeah, don't. You, by the way, you can go find really good editors on uh, Kindle KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing. That's how I found mine. Uh, Rolo, when are we starting a band with Phil? Phil from from uh, from All That Remains? Phil That Remains? I'm ready to go. What am I playing? Am I going to play bass? You're a guitarist, right? We would need a bass player. It's hard to find a bass player. I can play bass too. I play guitar or bass. We've got to have Phil in there. What kind of music will we play? We have to play something like really hard ass. We have to play something semi thrash. Something, something like just, you know, pushing, kicking the face fucking music. That would be badass. Didn't, didn't Phil, Phil used to, he used to, uh, he filled in for um, Five Fearing Death Punch for a while. I know that. I mean, All That Remains is really great too. It's, uh, man, I'll tell you something that gets me, Kyle, is like my band's new single is coming out the 12th. Oh, good. Mine's probably coming out to uh, May. <laughs> uh, well, the first EP anyways. Uh, my band's new single is coming out on the 12th. Jim Sexton on the show on January. Excellent. Yeah, mine too. Uh, we got him coming out in uh, to Vegas as well. I would love to get Phil, Phil that remains. <laughs> uh, I am so stoked. That, yeah, five. did he? Yeah, he, yeah, a few times. I know he filled in for a while. I know he wasn't actually a permanent member, but I know he was in the band for a little bit when I forget their lead singer's name when he was sick or something like that that was great phil that remains i'm so glad he follows us like i'm so glad that dude is like like red pillish enough like he follows me i'm like Fuck this dude i don't know i'm not starstruck but kind of kind of am anyways okay i gotta go uh my dog's gotta get fed and i gotta take him out guar there you go name your band name your favorite like metal band <laughs> Uh, so this has been the uh, New Year's Eve show. Thank you guys for participating. I appreciate all of your comments. I appreciate all of your stuff. I actually had some video I was going to get to, but I got rolling. So my bad. Uh, let's see. Pull those guys out of there. Um, I think that's about it for today. I am going to be, like I said, I've got some big plans coming up in uh, in the uh, next, in the coming year. I've got three books planned right now. Well, the first one's going to be the hardback of the first book. Uh, then I've got uh, Maxims. And then I've got the kind of, kind of a smallish textbook that I'm working on for the guys in the 45 to 65 demographic for the program that I'm working with Joe Marin on. And MOA, Men of Action. It will be part of the Men of Action Network, which, by the way, if you haven't, uh, uh, if you haven't subscribed or if you are interested in the Men of Action organization, uh, it's the only one I endorse, and not just because it's Mike, it's because it's a bottom-up, not a top-down organization. They're not trying to save the world. I'm just trying to save one guy at a time. And it's a bottom-up kind of approach, and that's why I really like it. Uh, if you want to subscribe to Men of Action, please use my link. It's like the second one down. Uh, Substack. I am regularly putting Substack out right now. Please become a paid subscriber. You can subscribe for free for now, but... Um, I have a lot of stuff coming up on Substack. I'm doing most of my writing on Substack right now. I still am going to, I'm actually going to be 
producing some new stuff for my old blog for uh, the Rational Mail blog. That's going to be, of course, my free stuff. But uh, for my paid subscriptions, that's going to end up being on Substack. Uh, and then uh, if you are a paid subscriber, you can also comment and I will comment back. I'm much more engaged there. Uh, again, I'm I'm uh, toying with the idea of talking about the um, the DHS NGO situation and that censorship. I think I'm probably going to produce that and put that out on um, on the Rational Mail on my blog and make it free so everybody can comment and put links and do all their good stuff on that. So that's coming up. Uh, let's see what else is coming. Oh, uh, Access Vegas. We're restarting or we're, we're next show is going to be January 11th. And then on the 25th, the 25th is going to be interesting. I'm hoping we can get Jim Sexton for one of these dates. Uh, we, we do have him on the books, by the way. Cappy, uh, Aaron Clary has been, he did an interview with Mike Sartain that should be coming up this week. He's in Vegas now as well, uh, at least for the, the winter time. And so I'll probably be doing some stuff with, with Aaron Clary. I'll be back at Red One Studios in the Southern Command Center down in Las Vegas very soon with uh, Miguel and Charlie. We're working on uh, really ramping that up this year. Uh, Access Vegas will be the 11th and then the 25th. The 25th. Keep your eye on that one because that's going to be the AVN uh, Expo Awards uh, show week that we're going to be. I, I did this last year too. Okay. You want Domo? You want Tiffany Fox? You want, uh, let's see, Sarah Jesse. What other porn stars? Do that? It's that uh, AVN is the adult video network, whatever. There you go. And last but not least, uh, Robert Lay to the godfather of the red pill. There you go. The grand visor of the manosphere, most wanted by the FBI, Socrates of the information age, lifter of Ned, <laughs> dead lifter of Ned. Uh, that red pill guy who must not be named, Swolo, bro, Tomasi, happy new year. Thank you very much for, for all of your love. And uh, I will see you guys. With that, we're out. <laughs> Just a kid when we met and went to bed It was my first time What do you expect from me? I'm breaking up the rules now in the game I've got Guilty. some new tools Please do this day Guilty. as time came by and went Over like a matchbox stereo Time to get my thoughts now and let go Round two, keep me up all
tell these bitches to go to 